Welcome back everybody to the Dolly Cooking Show, to the Dolly Cooking Stream. I hope you're all having a beautiful day today. If you're watching this live, it is currently Wednesday, 5 p.m. EDT. Today is April something or the other, perhaps April 10th even. Hi, welcome on in. It's good to see all of you. I missed you all so much. Hello to all of my lovely little sous chefs. I see that we have Jay, we have Erika at home, we have Liam, we have Trash Can Cat Mom, Moon Hud, Dosky, Annie, um, El Fohammer, Laz, Welcome on in. Also to I6, it's good to have all of you. It's good to see all of you. I'm really excited about today's stream. We have a bunch to talk about. We have a bunch to do today. Today is going to be maybe a really long stream. And I'm going to be doing today a couple of things that I've never done before. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to continue to talk about it. I'm really excited to continue talking about Georgian cuisine. I'm excited to continue talking about Georgian food. So we're about to get started on that in a moment. We'll talk about what we're making today. I talked so long and aggressively just now that I got a little out of breath. Are we going to make Jad, uh, Jack proud today? We're going to make Jack proud today, uh, Lady on. I promise you. So my friends, today we will be once again going to Georgia. Also, Death Owl, thank you so much for the sub. I realized I've also forgotten my AC remote. I also heard another notification just now. Um, do we have a, a hype train? I believe that's the case. Okay, so my friends. Today, we're going to be doing another couple of Georgian dishes. Uh, once again, this is in my quest to learn how to make a bunch of different Georgian dishes at home. I love Georgian cuisine. It's one of the ones that I really grew up eating uh, because there's a lot of Georgian restaurants in my part of Brooklyn. So as a family, you know, we'd ever, uh, we would go out to eat a lot to a lot of Georgian places. And as a result, it has become one of my favorite cuisines. It's also an incredibly unique cuisine. If you were to look at the geography, right, of the country of Georgia, and specifically, what sort of nations uh, border around it. You have Russia, you have Turkey, you have a lot of Eastern European influence, you have a lot of Middle Eastern influence, you also have some Chinese influence and North African influence, and as a result, you get one of the most rich and diverse and, quite frankly, interesting cuisines that not a lot of people know about. And so today, guys, we're going to be doing, I think, maybe one of the most important Georgian dishes. This is a dish that you would go out to eat, this is a dish that you would see served at every Georgian restaurant. This is a dish that you see served in Georgian homes. And it all starts, my friends, with this big chunk of beef. We're going to be making harcho. Harcho is a Georgian beef stew. Sometimes it's spicy, sometimes it's not. It's a stew with some beef in it and with some rice in it as well. So my friends, I have this massive hunk of beef here. Uh, this is, I believe, you know, uh, some, some more from like the leg. This might be like bottom ground or something. Uh, in general, when bracing, you should just basically use any cheap cut of meat. You can use chuck, you can use brisket, you can use short ribs, you can use round, you can do anything that you want. You just do not necessarily want to buy a steak. The reason why I chose this specific cut of meat uh, was first of all, my butcher, Carlos, gave me a lovely discount on it. Second of all, um, it's nice and lean. And so, as time has gone on, I've actually really started to appreciate braising and stewing and lean cuts of beef. Uh, and not something like a chuck all the time. I find that chuck can sometimes be so, so fatty. And thus, um, you know, I think this is bottom ground. It's going to be nice and tender um, without being like too greasy. But again, I implore you, you can use any kind of beef that you want for this. You can use any cut of lamb. It's all going to apply. I'm going to teach you some basic stewing and braising fundamentals. So this is about three pounds. I don't think I'm going to use all of this today. I'm going to cut it in half, I think. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and put that down. Okay, guys, the next component that is essential is something that we made on Sunday stream. This is some ajika. Ajika is a Georgian uh, condiment that's also like sometimes cooked into dishes. And it is a combination of cilantro, dill, parsley, celery, some Georgian spices, um, and a bunch of garlic and chilies as well. So it's herbaceous and it's spicy, and this is going to give the soup a lot of flavor today. Additionally, my friends, we have some celery because plenty of Georgian cooking features a lot of celery. We have some tomatoes, also Patrice, thank you so much for the sub. Uh, some tomatoes, this is going to be added towards the end for some acidity, some much needed acidity. Um, we have some Serrano chilies just in case we wanna add on to the spice. Now. Those are the basic components of today's stew, but my friends, let's talk about the second dish that we'll be doing today. We're going to be doing today something called elargi. Uh, elargi is essentially Georgian cheese grits. So you have grits, you have stone ground white cornmeal, right? And so I don't actually have the traditional Georgian white cornmeal that is used. Instead, I just have corn grits because this is white uh, cornmeal. 
right? It's stone ground, so it's nice and close. Um, essentially, this is gonna get cooked, this is gonna get boiled down, and to it, we're going to add a bunch of this Georgian cheese called suluguni. So it's just gonna be cheese grits. It's gonna be nice and melty and cheesy and stretchy. It's gonna be nice and salty. It's gonna be really pleasant. It's going to be incredible to eat with the stew. So you have like these delicious cheese grits, and then you have like this rich, spicy, herbaceous stew. Uh, this is half a block of suluguni cheese that I have left over, and I wanted to use up all of it, and I thought that this would be a really nice way of using up some leftover cheese. Alternatively, you can use also just plain old mozzarella. Mozzarella would make an excellent substitution in this case. And then guys, you also need some corn flour. So what makes this Georgian dish a large pretty special, uh, gome and a large, gome is essentially a large without the cheese, uh, is that it has both uh, grits as well as basic corn flour. I did not buy corn flour. Instead, I already have existing masa harina. Uh, and so, is this traditional what I'm about to do? Am I about to substitute corn flour for masa harina? And the answer is yes. So we will be substituting it. It's going to make it a little bit stickier, right? It's gonna make it sticky and then the cheese is gonna make it nice and creamy. It's gonna be delicious. And so my friends, that is the basic gist of all of the ingredients. Is everybody ready for today's show? I wanna hear a nice resounding yes chef from everybody watching. So two things. We're gonna be making the harchon, the beef stew, as well as the elargi, the cheese, uh, the cheese grits. So I'm really excited to get into it today. I don't feel like that's enough yes chefs. I feel like I need to see everybody flood on in. I wanna see everybody pile on in. Um, so the order of operations is as follows. We're gonna be sealing off the beef. We're going to be pressure cooking it to get it nice and tender, chopping up some onions, chopping up some celery. We have a lot of prep work that we need to get done for you today. So I think that we should go ahead and get started. Um, so I already have my cutting board set up. And as always, everybody, if you have any cooking questions whatsoever, I am here to help you learn how to cook. Also, welcome on in Nova Sphinx. Ooh, trash can cat mom, I hope it comes out well. So my friends, I have this big hulking chunk of beef here. And so we're just going to go ahead and cut this into the kind of uh, cubes that we want to eat in today's stew. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to actually tie my hair first. And again, guys, all I did was yesterday when I bought this piece of beef, I just put it onto a sheet tray to air dry um, so that it doesn't immediately like leach out water onto the cutting board. I love air drying my meat um, just any time that I buy it. Sheet tray, wire rack, ready to go. Put it in my fridge for like at least a day or so. Also, hi, 26 stacks. Welcome on in. So my friends, we have this massive chunk of beef. I'm going to go ahead and glove on up. Okay, beautiful. And now, Let's begin processing this beef. And so, roughly, I'm going to use about half of it. Have I ever dry aged 26 stacks? Not at home. I don't think that's like a home endeavor. It's a fun novelty project. Also, hi, Chess. welcome on in. So, we have this massive chunk of beef, guys. Let's go ahead and get it set up. Let's go ahead and get it going for us. Um, so how much do I actually want to use for today? This is roughly three pounds of beef. I don't think I need three pounds of, uh, you know, halucho uh, by the end of this. So let's do one and a half pounds. And so I think I'm just going to split it right down the middle lengthwise here. Something like this. And let's just go in and just get this bad boy cut in half. Open it up. Get it cut in half, get it all processed, and get it all ready to go. Beautiful. And so guys, my friends, I want you all to see something. You see all of these lines of connective tissue. This is why this kind of beef would not be super good to cook like a steak. But the reason why this kind of beef is so ideal for braising for long cooking times is that we're able to break down all the collagen, turn it into gelatin, and get it really, really nice and tender. It also is just that aggressively red. And so, uh, which chunk shall I be making into the stew today? I'm going to go ahead and save this for something else in the future. And this bad boy right here is what's going to be made into the stew. And so, we now have to figure out how we actually want to be chunking this up. Um, for something like uh, ho I don't want super tiny chunks of beef, right? I want it to be like a nice, good beef stew here. And so, we just have to make some big decisions at the moment. I see that we have like two different like sort of like muscle groups happening here, like they're naturally separating. Um, and so I feel somewhat inclined to just go in there and cut that out. But then I feel like this flap of meat would end up being too thin. So let's not do that. Let's not mess with that, my friends. Also, Golly Wheelie, welcome on in. Hope you're having a beautiful day today. Let's just go ahead and cut this in half lengthwise, like so. Okay, beautiful. 
something like this. Okay, and now my friends, let's go ahead and just cut this up into some nice little cubes. Also, welcome on in. Hello, hello, it's lovely to see you. Yeah, let's get some nice lovely little cubes out of this, guys. Um, well, not little, I want nice big thick cubes, in fact. Right? because I want this to be a nice stew. And so again, guys, you see all of this like super, super tough sinew running through it, all that super tough connective tissue, all of that is going to get nice and tender in the process of cooking. The reason why certain cuts of meat are better off as steaks is because they don't need a very long cook time to actually get them nice and tender. Something like this, to get this tender, it needs a lot of love. It needs a lot of love, a lot of care, and a lot of affection. Okay, so big, thick cubes of beef, my friends. Okay, and just slice it off. There you go. And a couple more. How much did this cost to make? Really good question. So this amount of beef that I got, this is maybe like 12 pounds of beef. Uh, well, 12 pounds. $12 of beef that I have right here. In total, this was about $24 worth of beef. Um, so it's not the cheapest, but it is going to make a significant amount of portions, my friends. Okay, so that's the first little thing of uh, beef here. And now let's go ahead and do the second half. So once again, nice big thick cubes. Beautiful, beautiful, couple more, and then we'll be done with the process. Okay, and one last one, my friends. There we go. So. We have now officially gotten all of the beef diced up. Uh, Leon, I am not in culinary school. I am entirely self-taught. I have absolutely no desire to go to culinary school. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get all of that lovely beef arranged for us today. Just get it onto my tray. And now my friends, we're just going to be heating up a nice big Dutch oven. So I'm gonna go ahead and take off my gloves because we don't really need them in a moment. And now let's talk about this vessel and why we're using this today. So. I'm actually going to be using both my pressure cooker and the Dutch oven for this today. The reason for that is because of the logistics of actually streaming at home. Because of the fact that it would typically take maybe like two hours to cook beef that thick, right, in a regular Dutch oven, a pressure cooker is going to help eliminate some of the time. And so we're going to just do it in two pots. If you wanted to do this all in one Dutch oven, I'll talk about like the method to do that, which is essentially just putting a lid on it and letting it simmer for about two hours or so. But my friends, we're going to be starting off by searing this beef. We're going to get a really, really beautiful crust on it. We're going to get some of those meaty flavors developed because I don't just want boiled beef. I don't just want braised beef. I want it to have a nice good sear on it so that it has a lot of flavor. And so my friends, we're going to begin by heating up my Dutch oven. And so this is where it begins, everybody. The Dutch oven, the enamel Dutch oven, is something that a lot of people do not understand how to use. And so, we're going to get into one of my favorite food rants of all. And that is talking about how others mistreat a Dutch oven and how to actually properly take care of one. So we're about to get into that in just a second. But first, I'm going to put in some oil and I'll talk to you why I'm putting in some oil. So my friends, this is an enamel Dutch oven. This is a Le Creuset. A lot of kitchens have these. You might have a Cuisinart one, you might have a different brand one, but a lot of people have a Dutch oven at home. So, the number one rule that I see people mess up all the time, I do not want you using metal on your enamel Dutch oven because it is in the name. It is enameled, my friends. This inner coating here, you almost want to treat it and consider it like a non-stick pan. Okay, because that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be a nice, non-reactive surface atop the cast iron. And so, when you're using metal utensils, metal tongs, a metal spatula, a metal spoon, and you're scraping the bottom, you're going to scratch and damage your enamel over time. Even professional chefs of however many years, I see them, okay, using metal whisks on the Dutch ovens and scratching the bottom. So everybody, I need to hear a nice yes chef right now. I want to make sure that none of you are using metal utensils on it. Wooden ones or silicone ones only. Okay, that's the first rule. Second rule, everybody. This is a Dutch oven. It is a thick piece of cast iron. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make is to unevenly heat your metal. How do you unevenly heat your metal? By blasting it onto a high heat. By putting it onto a high heat and then you sprinkle in a little bit of water and you're like, oh, it's hot enough to cook. You actually end up developing hot spots and cool spots. To get cast iron to be nice and even, you have to heat it up slowly over a medium heat or a high heat, I guess, over a long period of time. So we're not just heating this up for one second on a high heat, we're heating this up on medium heat for five minutes and that way our surface will be nicely and evenly and beautifully heated. 
photical. You don't want to blast it with the super high heat because that does end up damaging the enamel over time. So guys, take care of your tools. Take good care of them. Give them a lot of love. Give them a lot of affection. Give them a lot of appreciation. And I promise you, they will love you back. Okay? Take care of your tools. Take care of your stuff. And they will last you a really, really long time. And so we're heating it up with the oil uh, because it's also bad practice to heat these things up when they're empty. That can also damage the enamel over time. So we're only heating it up when it has water or oil or something else inside of it. And so my friends, uh, here's my next rule, okay? So I have a question for all of you. I have a question for all of you. How many times have you seen a recipe that has said, oh, I want you to seal this piece of beef, right? Especially if it's for something like a stew. And then you notice that the meat kind of buckles the meat buckles and it doesn't evenly get color on the bottom. How many of you have noticed that happen? Okay, especially with like a stew when it's not like a steak on a super, super hot pan. How many of you notice it's like really difficult to get a nice consistent stew? That happens because you're cooking the outside of the meat too quickly, especially when you have little chunks, little chunks that are still nice and thick and you have the heat be too hot. You're overcooking the outside and the meat is really quickly buckling. To get all of these pieces of stew meat to be nicely and evenly seared, the two rules are number one, medium heat over a longer period of time. And number two, we never overcrowd the pan. You overcrowd the pan and it starts to steam and it doesn't allow the uh, actual moisture to escape. Second of all, if your heat is too high, it's going to buckle Okay, it's going to overcook the outside before you can actually develop a proper crust. So it takes time, it takes effort, but I promise you guys, it's all gonna work out. So not too hot is the key to this. Not too hot and do not overcrowd it. I know there's a lot of rules I talked about just now, but I'm going to show you all uh, how to do this in practice in just a moment. And so guys, I'm just going to go ahead and get a little coaster plate ready to go for us. And I'm going to go ahead and grab my lovely little tongs. And again, we're just slowly but surely heating up this pan. This might take, in total, a couple more minutes. Because again, the goal is to get it evenly, evenly, evenly heated. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? Can I hear a nice yes, chef? We have everybody watching. I want to make sure that all of my advice uh, has gotten through to you. And so, while that's heating up, I'm just going to be quickly washing off my knife because we have a second of downtime. So let me just go ahead and get that nicely and out of the way. Oh yeah, I guess we should also salt the beef while we have a second, but... The salting of the beef is not super essential because it's still just going to happen later in the process anyways. So we'll just do it when it hits the pan. And I think that would be fine. Okay, just quickly washing off my knife, my friends. Does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? Oh, I love all these yes chefs. Perfect. I'm glad, I'm glad you guys have become so compliant. I'm glad that all of you are listening so well to me today. Love it. It's my favorite. And so guys, again, I'm also using some olive oil here um, because again, this is going to be a stew. I want to use a nice tasty oil. Uh, I don't want to use something like canola oil or peanut oil because it's all going to go back into the pot. I would like something that ideally um, tastes quite good. So olive oil is good. If you have tallow, if you have like beef tallow or beef fat, that would also be pretty ideal. Uh, normally, I would do a little bit less oil if I was using something like a chuck because a chuck has a lot more fat. This beef specifically today, though, it doesn't have that much fat. Um, okay, my knife is now nicely dried off. I'm going to be exchanging my cutting board, just throwing that into my dishwasher. And then my friends, we're going to be prepping the rest of the stuff that we need for today's stew. And it's gonna be good. It's gonna be delicious. I'm really, really excited about today's dish, guys. Okay, so my oil has gotten now nice and hot. Right? This has been slowly heating up for like the last 40 minutes or so. I feel like now would be a pretty okay time to go ahead and add the beef in. The oil is shimmering, but even with the olive oil, it's not smoking hot, my friends. If it was super, super hot, if it was smoking hot, we're going to end up buckling and overcooking the outside of the meat before we actually develop a proper crust. To develop a proper crust on this beef, we're going to first do this in two batches, in two separate installations. So first, I'm just going ahead and making sure that my olive oil is nicely distributed around the pan. It's not significantly smoking. And now, guys, I'm going in and I'm adding my beef cubes, distributing the oil and adding it in one by one. And I'm going clockwise just to remember the order that I added everything in. Just drop those bad boys in. And again, guys, we're not going to overcrowd this pan. We're going to make sure that each of my lovely little chunks of beef here have enough space to themselves. 
And let's do probably one last chunk right here. Lovely. I could probably move that around in a second. And so my friends, it is starting to slightly stick a little bit. Okay, we're starting to stick a little bit. And so that's completely okay. So all that we're going to do, we're going to wait for the meat to naturally unstick itself. The only thing I'm going to quickly do is I'm just going to give this a nice little rotation because that side didn't get as much olive oil. My oven is a little bit tilted. So I have to give it a little rotation. So my friends, this is going to take some time. Again, nice and slow, medium, medium low heat here. And I promise you, if the beef is immediately sticking, just give it some time and it will naturally unstick itself. Don't force it, don't grab your tongs and start trying to rip out chunks of beef. I promise you, my friends, be patient. Can I please get a yes, chef? Please and thank you. And so while the beef is going, we're going to go ahead and get some of the other stew ingredients prepped and ready to go, my friends. So let's go ahead and dice up an onion. Mm. Okay, got my onion out, got my waste bowl also ready to go. Um, this is normal extra virgin olive oil. And I'm okay with that because I'm not using it at like a super high temperature anyways. I don't really care about smoke points unless I'm deep frying. And so guys, I'm just also going to go ahead and give it a little tug. And you can see the beef is starting to naturally unstick itself. All you had to do was just be patient. Be patient. Be patient and it would be amazing. Also, Dakota, welcome on in. It's lovely to have you. The beef is going. And now my friends, let's go ahead and work on this onion. I have one cheap onion here. It's just a Spanish onion, not a sweet onion, nothing crazy. The onion is going to make my stew nice and sweet. It's going to make it nice and aromatic. It's going to give it that allium quality. Quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, you cannot have a stew without alliums. The beef might be the most important part, but there is no such thing as a stew without onions. And so my friends, we're going to start off by cutting off the head. Okay, so this is the root of the onion and this is the head. So we cut off the head and we keep the root intact and we slice this bad boy in half. I'm going to show you exactly why. Ignoring my camera, switching to a different dimension. Switching over to a different color there. Okay. And so I'm just going to now peel off the skin of these onions. And so guys, we're going to go ahead and inspect the beef again really quickly. We're going to see how it's sticking, or maybe not at all. And then we're going to give it a good old flipping session. Okay, so let's head back to the stove really quickly. So guys, let's give it this bad boy a little flip. And as you can see, we got already a really, really beautiful crust starting to develop. You saw that the beef, when we added it in, also Dakota, thank you so much for the gift that's up. Thank you, thank you. You saw when we added the beef, my friends, that it was stuck, that it was sticking. That one is still not done yet, right? That one is still not completely unstuck. But some of these guys, they've naturally begun, begun to unstick on their own. They're slipping and sliding around, and that's exactly what we want to see. We're not doing a tug of war with the pan, my friends. We're letting it naturally unstick itself. How do I feel about using scallion when yellow or red onions are not available? Um, I absolutely recommend using scallions, uh, Mr. PH Murf. I'm not really sure how to say that. The only issue is, is that scallions, they tend to burn sooner. So you can't really saute them as heavily as you would uh, other kinds of onions. So you just have to keep that in mind and then carry on. Okay, my friends, look at that, beautiful, beautiful. And so, it's usually the, the beef that's like on the edges of the pan that tends to stick the most. So we're just letting it go. Guys, again, the key to this, medium heat. Medium heat over a long period of time, and I promise you, you're going to get a beautiful color on that beef. Look at the seal on it. It's not immediately releasing liquid, it's not buckling. We got that crust developed. Also, Dosky, thank you for stopping by nonetheless. It was lovely to have you. Hope you enjoy your plans for tonight. And so guys, I'm going to go ahead and take this last piece of beef. This one didn't seal up that well because it was on the edges and that's totally okay. Guys, medium, medium heat is gonna be your best friend. Also, thank you so much Dosky for five gifted subs before you left. Uh, please accept this apology anytime. I'm happy to do so. Okay, my friends, let's go ahead and continue with the onions. And so for today's onions, I'm looking for a medium dice. So I'm not going to be looking for a super fine dice because I want to occasionally get like a remnant of a chunk of onion inside, right? But I'm not looking uh, for like massive chunks of onion either because guys, this stew is all about the beef. So let me try to go ahead and get the rest of the skin off, which is a little bit of a challenge today, actually. This, this onion, guys, it's just not peeling. 
The beef is getting a nice good crust on it though, guys. We're making good progress. Everything is going exactly the way that it needs to be. It's now currently frying in all of its own beautiful fat. Oh, gorgeous. You know, my friends, I think we can actually transfer this beef to my pressure cooker pot. So let's go ahead and get that done right now. I'm gonna go ahead and just put this beef over here. And then we're going to go ahead and do the next batch of beef, guys. Back to the stove. We got all of that beautiful seared beef. And again, don't worry about the seasoning. Don't worry about the salting. All of that is still going to come. And I'm just going to take it and just immediately put it into my pressure cooker pot, my friends. We got a beautiful crust developed. We don't have to push that crust anymore. Okay. There you go, my friends. That is a bunch of beautiful seared beef. I promise you all the seasonings, all the spices are going to come right in. And so, you can hear that it's hissing a little bit. You can hear that it's popping. There's some residual moisture that's currently evaporating. Okay, and guys, you see all of that stuff on the bottom. You see all that burnt stuff on the bottom. That's called fond. As meat cooks, it releases a little bit of liquid. In that liquid is dissolved proteins. And as the water evaporates, those proteins go ahead and stick to the bottom. And this fond is going to go into the stew at the end of the day. I promise you guys, it's going to find its way. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be delicious. I'm just moving around my pan really quickly and I'm going in with my next batch of beef so in it goes once again guys medium heat I don't want to burn the fond I don't want to buckle the beef too quickly my next batch of beef medium heat only my friends medium heat is the key to making good stews to making good braises to sealing large chunks of beef medium heat every single day of the week my friends so just adding all of it in one by one it's not even sticking as much as the last batch was. There you go. And now we're just letting it go and let it do its thing, my friends. Can I start over the recipe? Absolutely. How do I get a sear on non-red meats without burning the fond? So, uh, Mr. PH Murphy, are you asking about things like chicken? Is that what you're asking? Because I feel like my fundamentals and my idea here is still the same. But, guys, I will say this. So, a lot of your fond, okay, it comes from the water that gets pushed out of the meat itself. The best thing to do is to air dry your meat. Air dry your meat, air dry your meat, and you'll get rid of some of the excess water. I find that when you have a, like a, you know, uh, like an absolute like dripping wet piece of meat and you go directly into the pan like that, what ends up happening is it just immediately releases a bunch of liquid and then you have already stuff sticking and burning to the bottom. So pat it dry and make sure that you air dry your meat. I put it on a sheet tray, wire rack in the fridge, good to go. Okay, my friends, let's go ahead and continue with my onion prep. I finally got all the onion skin, uh, skin peeled off. And so we're looking to go ahead and get a nice medium diced onion. Not so fine that we don't feel it at all, but not so large that we have large chunks of onion. The onion is going to help make this stew today, my friends, nice and aromatic and delicious. So we're making a bunch of incisions and this is my patented onion fan method. Well, not my method, but I'm patenting it. So guys, we make a bunch of incisions, and here's what we do. We fan out the onion. It's held together at the core of the onion, okay? And so, all that's left to do now, my friends, is we go in and we get a nice medium dice. We pull the knife, we pull it, we pull it all the way through until we have just the root attached and we toss out the root. And my friends, the kitchen tool that all of you should own is of course a handy dandy little bench scraper. Scoop it up and into your transfer bowl it goes. Let's go ahead and inspect the beef one more time. Let's see how it's doing. Let's see how the crust is developing, how the fond is developing as well. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Nice medium heat, my friends. That is the trick to doing this. Okay, this one's still a little bit stuck, so we're not going to force the issue. This one's also a little bit stuck still, so we're not going to force it. Just take it and redistribute the oil and let it keep doing its thing slowly but surely. Medium, low heat. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to the onions. Guys, look at that beef. That beef has nothing on it, and it still looks so delicious at this stage of the cooking. Okay? And yes, exactly as Natorio Osu said, we're not using the side of a knife to scoop things up. You dull your knife and then you risk cutting yourself. Buy a bench scraper. Can I please get a yes chef? So my friends, let's go ahead and do this with the rest of the onion half that we have here. Make a bunch of incisions all the way through. And once again, we're getting a nice medium dice on this bad boy. Medium, medium, just pull out the onion, pull it through, pull out the knife. Beautiful. And that's it. 
Okay, there you go. And I'm just going to go ahead and get that into my trans food bowl. Lovely. So my friends, one large onion that I have here, nice and chopped up, I use a Spanish onion. Feel free to sub in any kind of alliums that you would like. But my friends, the dish that we're doing today is a harcho. This is going to be a delicious, beautiful Georgian stew. We have so many components, we have so many ingredients that we have to get through today, and it's going to be delicious. The pressure cooking stage is actually just going to be the onions and the beef uh, alongside some bay leaves. And then we'll be adding the spices and the tomatoes after it's been cooked. And I'll talk to you why we're doing that. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and now, my friends, you can see that beef has naturally unstuck itself. Yep, you can see, just gliding around this pan, not stuck in the slightest. We're getting all of this beautiful color, all this beautiful form developed. Guys, I'm telling you, all of those stuck proteins on the bottom of the pot, all of those stuck proteins on the bottom of the pan, that is what's going to give us a delicious stew at the end of the day. That is where all of the meaty flavor is, my friends. That is where all the oomph is, okay? And so the onions are gonna go in there soon. We're going to essentially be scraping up some of it, but we'll be going back to Dutch oven uh, soon enough. So that's all inside, that's all happening. Um, okay, let's talk about the rest of the components that we're going to need for today. Um, for today, my friends, I'm going to be using some lovely bay leaves. So we have some lovely bay leaves right here. Um, I want a bunch of bay leaves. And so I'm just looking for pieces that aren't too small like this, because it'd be really, really difficult to get them out of the pot, right? So I want a bunch of bay leaves. I want something nice and aromatic, my friends. There you go. Bunch of bay leaves. Let's do one more, probably. And I think that looks good. And I'm just going to go ahead and throw that into my pressure cooker pot, not my Dutch oven. Just get that all ready to go for us today. Okay, and then I'm still contemplating, do I actually want to saute the celery at all? Or do I just want to add um, the celery at the end? We'll think about that. Chef, is there a reason to spend up for fresh bay leaves? Uh, good question, Serena. I only get dry bay leaves. I've never used a fresh bay leaf before. So I have actually no idea. I've never gotten a chance to, uh, to work with one, but generally speaking, fresh herbs do have more flavor. Dried herbs are a lot more muted. Guys, look at that pan. That looks pretty beautiful, doesn't it? So let's go ahead and let's get this beef out and into my pressure cooker pot. All of it inside, all of it nicely covered with all of that liquid, okay? Get all of it in there. And my friends, you can see that the bottom of the pan is a little bit wet. This meat started to, oop, excuse me. This meat started to release some liquid. And it's okay, the meat is not fully cooked through at this point, but what we're looking to do is we're looking to first evaporate this liquid. We're going to add in some more oil, and then we're going to properly saute the onions. We're gonna get them nice and golden brown and delicious. In the meantime, I'm just going to quickly wipe off this little bit here. But guys, look at all of that fond, all of that fond, all of that delicious, incredible beef fat. Let's now go in with another big splash of olive oil, right? So that we can go ahead and make sure that the onions have a nice even contact with the pan. Guys, look at that fond on the bottom. Look at the fond on the bottom. If you were to use a high heat with this dish, you would end up squelching all of your beautiful fond. That fond is the base. It is the heart and it is the soul of this kind of a dish, my friends. Okay, and so you have to respect the fond. Respect the fond and it will respect you in time. So let's get all of my lovely onions into the pan once again. My friends, what heat are we using? I wanna, I wanna make sure that everybody knows what heat we're using. So I need somebody to answer this for me. Okay, all that is inside, beautiful. Medium low, that's right, Serena. Medium, low heat. And I know the bottom of the pan looks a little bit scorched at the moment, but I promise you the fond is still not there yet, that we have to deglaze it. The onions, they're naturally going to collapse, and the onions are going to release their own liquid. We're going to release the liquid from the onions, and then that's going to re-dissolve the proteins, and then we're going to scrape it back up into the onions. So we're almost deglazing with the onions, which is a little bit weird to think about, but it's because onions are so wet. And so, if you feel like that process is happening a little too slowly, and your fond isn't there yet, feel free to add in like a splash of liquid or so. A little splash of liquid just to get the bottom of it started. I don't think I'm at that stage yet, but we'll decide if that is actually at all necessary. And so that only, that exclusively depends as to where the pan is at. I no longer need these tongs. I'm going to go ahead and dispose of them. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of them. Once again, we're just continuing on with the medium heat, my friends. Okay. 
And I'm just continuing to stir it up, just stir it up a little bit. And I'm scraping up the bottom. And so it doesn't actually look like my onions today are going to be releasing that much liquid. And so guys, what's going to really, really help out, I think is going to be, you know what, let's be patient. Let's give them some more time. Let's give them a little bit more time. Let's be nice and patient with them. I think they're going to do exactly what we need them to do soon enough. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me at the moment? And so once the onions are done, I don't think I'm going to be sauteing the celery at all. We're just going to get it into the pressure cooker pot. It's going to be lovely. It's going to cook up. Um, and then we'll be moving on with the rest of the stuff because we have a bunch of other vegetables. We have a bunch of fresh herbs. We have the chilies. And then we have to also do the allergy. Uh, so cyber got fruits. There is no wine in this today. This is a hard shot. So it's not like your traditional like Western European like braise that has like wine or anything. Um, it's going to be really, really simple, but it's going to be really focusing on the chilies and on the herbs today. Okay. So yeah, I think it is now time for me to call it. And let's go ahead and get a little splash of water in here. And let's dissolve some of that lovely fond, my friends. Does anybody have any questions for me? Okay, a little splash of water. Maybe that was more water than I was intending, but that's okay. And now guys, now that we've added the water, we can go ahead and turn up the heat. And all I'm really looking to do is just to scrape up the bottom. We're scraping it up, we're scraping it up. We're getting all of those proteins dissolved inside of the water and back into the onions and into the liquid. Okay, my friends? And so now we're just going to evaporate the liquid and I just wanna to continue to soften the onions. And once the liquid is evaporated, we'll be able to properly fry the onions in the oil once again. So all of that, that's just going, that's just cooking up now, and it's gonna be delicious. Um, Ren in a bin, well, I'm glad. I'm here to answer any and all cooking questions because guys, let me tell you something right now. The way that braises are taught, the way that people talk about doing beef in batches and doing a braise, I feel like there is so much misinformation out there. There is so much. Also, I just wanna mention something right now. You know this entire step of searing the beef and getting some color on it? Well, that intensifies the flavor. But guys, let me, let me let you in on something. I need you all to tap in. I need you all to look at me for something right now. Food is as only good as the intentions with which applied to it. If you want, I need to hear the chef right now. I need to make sure that all of you are listening because I'm gonna blow your minds right now. This entire step of searing the beef and searing the onions, is it necessary? Well, it's necessary if you're going for what I'm going for. But you know what you can do instead? You could just boil everything. Is it going to have as much flavor? Is it going to be as meaty? Is it going to have that oomph? Not necessarily, but is it still gonna be delicious? And the answer is probably. So this is a bit of an optimization that we're doing here. We're really getting a lot more flavor out of it this way. But if you were to theoretically just boil the beef and onions, well, not boil, you know, simmer it, it would still be good at the end of the day. So you could theoretically skip all the stuff if you really wanted to. Now, if your goal is to get a really proper, rich, delicious, meaty braise, then go ahead and do what I want to do. If your goal is to get a weeknight, like a weeknight dinner, something really quick, something really, really fast, and you still want to braise, you could theoretically just braise it by putting it directly into liquid. And that is the beauty of cooking. Food is as only good as the intentions applied to it. Okay, my friends. So this is not a make or break for this kind of a dish. It makes it significantly better, which is why I'm doing it, but it's not going to ruin the dish if you do not want to put in this much effort. And so my friends, I'm also going to season up my onions and also get a nice big handful of salt into the pot, but we're going to need so much salt for this quantity of stew that I'm preparing that this is ba basically negligible. Although just seasoning in layers just does a really nice job of making sure that everything penetrates. And so my friends, we're just looking to evaporate the liquid. We're looking to soften up these onions and then everything is just gonna go back on into the pot. Okay, so really quickly, um, once the onions do dry up, we're going to add in a nice little squish of tomato paste. So I'm gonna make sure that my tomato paste is out and ready to go for us. And so, this has a very, very little amount of the actual flavors that we're going to need today, my friends. So, the real, real heart and soul of Georgian cooking is in the herbs and in the spices as well. And so later on, we're going to be adding in some savory. We're going to be doing some freshly ground coriander as well. It's gonna have a lot of spices. It's going to be really, really incredible. So I know this looks bland right now, but you just have to stay with me. Just trust the process. It's going to be spicy. It's gonna be delicious. It's going to be aromatic. It's going to have everything that you could possibly want inside. I'm just going to go ahead and measure out some uh, tomato paste. I'm not looking for this stew, by the way, to be too tomatoey. 
Uh, here's my thought, by the way, I have a thought really quickly. I think that when it comes to braises and meat sauces, people tend to actually put too much tomato. It becomes a little too tomato forward. I want that tomato. We still have fresh tomatoes that we'll be adding in towards the end for the acidity. But to actually get some of that sweetness, to get some of that oof out of the tomatoes, I'm only going to be adding what is, to my eye, maybe like three quarters of a tablespoon something like that of tomato paste into the whole thing. It's going to give it a little bit of oomph, it's going to give it some tomato flavor, but it's not going to be anything too crazy, okay? And so we just have that waiting for us. I'm just going to be stirring up the onions again as we're just evaporating all of the liquid from them so that my onions can then hopefully beautifully fry. While we're waiting for that to get done, I'm not actually going to initiate that much more stuff. Um, I'm just gonna be measuring some stuff out for later. So my tomato paste is already ready to go. guys. One of the best things that you could have as a home cook, I think, is condiment cups. I love having condiment cups around. Um, it makes your life significantly easier, especially when it comes to organizing spices, when it comes to organizing garlic, and so forth. Also, I did actually forget that we do need some garlic because we're going to add some to the sautéing onions just about when they're finished. My friends, I have a head of garlic here. This is a beef stew. You know what beef loves? Beef loves garlic. Beef stews love their garlic. And so, here's what I want to do, my friends. I want to have garlic added in several stages. We're going to have garlic added in the ajika that we already have prepared. We're going to have some garlic added in the sautéing stage. But then I'm also going to have some just raw minced garlic towards the end. Because that way we get a lot of different flavors of the garlic. We get it really stewed in there. We get a lot of its pungency, um, especially when we add it towards the end. And so my friends, it's a beef stew. We need a bunch of garlic. I'm doing like five big, big cloves of garlic, okay? I'm serious about it. Five, maybe even six cloves of garlic for today. Because you can't have too much garlic, can we? I wanna hear a nice no chef from everybody watching, please and thank you. And as you guys may know, one of my most hated kitchen tasks that I cannot stand above all else. Also, let's mix up the onions, not this. Mixing up the onions, I do not hate. I love you guys, I promise. Oh, guys, they've picked up all of those beef juices. They've picked up all that fond. We're just keeping it again on a medium heat. They got nice and translucent. And now it's time to properly fry them. So my friends, I have all of this garlic here. The thing that I hate most is chopping garlic, especially when you got a minced garlic, because it's sticky. And when something is sticky, it sticks all over your cutting board, it sticks to your hands, it sticks to your knife. So let me show you what to do. We're going to first take the humble bench scraper and we're going to flatten it. We're going to flatten each of them one of these bad boys. You wish this were you. Oh honey, it's 5.42 p.m. It's time for your garlic flattening session. Okay. Each and one of them, let's get them nice and flattened. And so why are we flattening them? We're flattening them so that we can go ahead and easily separate the skin from each of the cloves. Okay? Each of the cloves, nice and separated from the skin. Right, there you go, nice and easy. And now my friends, take a look. Right, all of the skin just easily, easily pops out of each garlic clove. Just like that. Lovely. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. Medium heat on the onions, my friends. And also, this is the stage where we should be stirring up a little bit more often because uh, this is where, now that the water has evaporated, the onions are frying, it can stick, it can burn, it can do all of that stuff. So just make sure that we're stirring it fairly often. Medium, medium, low heat, my friends. Okay, dokie. Okay. And let's just continue peeling up all of the garlic. Let's get all of that skin off because of course we do not need the skin, my friends. Okay, and so my friends, everybody, should be investing in a garlic press. Because guess what? Chopping garlic is laborious, it is tedious, and above all else, it is unnecessary. A garlic press is not as difficult to clean as people make it out to be. Just run it under some water and poke it with a brush to get all the garlic out from between the holes, okay? And so, we're almost done. I don't think I actually squashed this clove enough. There you go. We gave him a nice little smashing. And now, all of that garlic skin just pops off nice and easy. Okay, and I left a little bit over there. Okay, so that's all of my garlic cloves nice and peeled. Once again, guys, medium low heat. This is where we're stirring the onions fairly often. Okay, we're not leaving them too alone. We don't want to burn the fawn. We don't want to burn the onions. Okay? Whew. Guys, today is going to be a long stream. Today we're going to food a long haul. Are you guys in a food a long haul? I'm going to hear yes, chef. If you are, please and thank you. And so, guys, all that we're going to do, actually, first, I'm going to trim the butts off of each of my garlic cloves. Just get all those butts off, get them out of here. 
have no use for them. Okay, and that one doesn't have one, great. And so guys, let's go ahead and get all of this garlic nice and minced, nice and pressed. Serena, thank you for telling us what you'll be doing with your time. You could leave at any point if you would like to. You don't have to give me a reason why, but thank you for telling me why. Okay. Ah, all of that garlic, my friends, get it nice and pressed. I'm going to just quickly go back to my onions again because we have to babysit these guys at this point. We have to babysit them. We have to make sure the onion juices aren't scorching, the onions aren't scorching, the fond isn't. Okay, so there's a lot that needs to be done here. Okay, guys, and let's just go ahead and continue on with the garlic smashing, the garlic pressing. There you go. And a couple more to go, my friends. And some of these, again, we're going to be saving some to add towards the end, and some of it will be sauteing and properly frying up as well. Okay, ooh, that's a lot of garlic, guys. We are garlic moating today. There you go, and there you go. Guys, you cannot have too much garlic. You absolutely cannot. It is like a tiny potato, guys, so you're absolutely right. Okay, my friends, so we have a bunch of garlic, and now I'm going to go ahead and grab a little teeny tiny baby teaspoon, and let's go ahead and get the garlic into the pot. Remember, because of the fact that the garlic burns quite easily, we have to be stirring it often. So, like three quarters of the garlic that we just cut up, that we just got processed, okay? I probably let this pan go on a little too long. My fawn started getting a little bit dark again, but that's okay. So I'm adding in the garlic, guys, and we're moving it and mashing it and mixing it around. We don't want the garlic to scorch, we just want it to fry up a little bit. Okay, letting the garlic go, we're letting the onions go, we're letting all of it do its thing. And now guys, we'll also be adding in the tomato paste and letting that fry up a little bit as well. Okay, just getting that in there, lovely. And then I'm going to deglaze it all with some water just so that we can get all of the fond into the pot, my friends. So all the tomato paste is inside, all the garlic is inside, we're frying everything up all together. And then we're going to get it all into my pressure cooker pot in just a moment. Stirring it often, stirring it constantly. And now one last deglazing session, my friends. Just to get all of that stuff scraped up from the bottom and dissolved into my liquid. Once again, a little splash of water. All of it dissolved. Let's clean up the pan. Let's make sure nothing is sticking, nothing is staining, nothing is gonna get it dirty. Let's get all of it dissolved. Every single last drop of it, my friends. And there you go, that's my tomatoes, that's my garlic, and that is my onion. All cleaned up, all of it ready to go, and now I'm going to go ahead and scoop it and put it into my pressure cooker pot. That was a lot of work for this stage. I know it was a lot of effort, but I promise you, it's all going to pay off. So I'm just going to take it, and I'm going to drop it all in to my pressure cooker. There we go. And so my friends, I actually want to talk to you all about something really quickly. Um, if you're going to also be using a pressure cooker for this recipe, I would really, really highly advise you to not do the searing step inside of the pressure cooker pot. And we're going to talk about why that is in a second. So, for those of you that are familiar with Instant Pots, you will know that they offer a setting for sautéing, and then people say that they will brown beef in it. And so, here is my issue with that. Even though it's technically easier to get it all done in the same pressure cooker pot, and even though it's technically safe to do it over an open flame, the reality is this. The quality of the steel on an Instant Pot isn't particularly amazing. It's kind of a whatever stainless steel. As a result, it's not going to give you a very amazing seal on any piece of meat that you'll be using it for. And so, what I highly recommend doing, if you want to go through that process of getting a color, if you want to go ahead and get that process of getting a really nice seal, my friends, I would always use a separate pan for it. And so in my case, I'm using a Dutch oven for extreme reasons. But right here, my friends, this is my pressure cooker pot now, filled with water, filled with my tomatoes, filled with my onions, okay? my tomatoes, my onions, my beef, and my bay leaves. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to give everything a nice little stir and make sure that my tomato paste isn't in any like pockets so that it's all nice and dissolved inside of my water. There you go. And that, my friends, is going to take quite a long time to cook. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this in my pressure cooker pot. Uh, I'm gonna do about 40 minutes on high pressure. 
also maybe like 35 minutes on high progression and then 10 minutes of natural pressure release if you wanted to just do this in a pot which is my recommended method you would want to do this for two hours bring it to a boil drop to a simmer put a lid on and then you're going to be cooking it for two hours does everybody understand i want to hear the nice yes chef please and thank you so i'm going to go ahead and take my pressure cooker pot elsewhere we're going to go ahead and get the pressure cooking done and happening and ready to go for us just drop it on pressure cook high heat for about i'm gonna do like 40 minutes my friends and so what are we doing by pressure cooking it what is actually happening what are the different mechanisms that are at play so what are we doing here we're looking to braise the meat. We're looking to stew it. We're looking to get it nice and tender. That's not enough people saying, yes, yeah, chef. So let's try that one more time, please, and thank you. By braising something, what we're essentially doing is we're taking all of the collagen and turning it into gelatin. And this is the way that I want you to think about meat, my friends. So meat is like a sponge. The more that you cook it, the more that you're almost wringing the sponge. And wringing the sponge, what happens is the proteins, they get closer and closer together, so it gets really, really tough and the more liquid it ends up releasing. So that is from the point that it is raw until 160 degrees, the meat is objectively getting less juicy and it's getting tougher. But then something very special happens. After 160 degrees, once we start hitting the 175 territory, the meat begins to almost collapse. The collagen turns into gelatin. The gelatin is able to soak up some amount of liquid and the meat becomes tender once again. And so you do this method. You do this method of braising with especially historically tough cuts of meat. Chuck, brisket, um, you know, this is leg meat. This comes from like either the top round or the bottom round, you know, like a leg of lamb or something. That is why we uh, braise and stew these super, super tough cuts of meat because they have these bands of connective tissue. They have these bands of sinew that would otherwise be way too tough to eat. They're not suitable. These cuts of beef are not particularly suitable for a steak because that connective tissue is so tough and so chewy at most temperatures. Okay, and so everybody, all I'm doing right now is I'm just going to go ahead and clean up my station. Also, this is why having a bench scraper, hint, hint. French voice, but oh, do I am going? The meat will be overcooked at 175. The only temperature that I would consider objectively anything being overcooked is 160. You got to pick one, right? Either we keep it nice and juicy below 140, or we're going through something super, super tender at 175. And so it is intentional overcooking, Tarina. So I'm just going to go ahead and get all that garlic off of my bench scraper. Lovely. And I'm just going to go ahead and just set my pressure cooker pot aside because we're not going to need her for a good while. Pick that up and I'm just gonna slap a lid on it. Okay, my friends, let's talk about everything else that needs to get done for today's incredible stew, for today's incredible braise. So, a couple of things that need to get done, my friends. Um, let's go ahead and look at me really quickly. So today, we're doing two things. We're doing a Georgian harcha, and we're also going to be doing a Georgian allergy. All that we've done so far, we seared the beef, we seared the onions, we seared the garlic and the tomato paste, and it's currently in my pressure cooker so that it all gets nice and cooked down. But that is not the beginning, and that is not the end of this tale either because we're still going to be making the spice blend for it. Um, in Georgian cooking, there is a spice blend called Cameli Sunelli, uh, I believe. Canelli Sunelli, I believe. I'm not sure if I'm saying that entirely correctly, but it's a collection of a lot of different fresh herbs uh, that have then been dried. I don't actually have that spice blend, um, so instead we'll be using a bunch of different herbs and we'll be making it work out today. This stew is going to be nice and spicy. We'll be adding in some ajika and the allergy, guys. This is the thing that I'm incredibly excited about today. So let's talk about this really quickly. It is amazing how many different cultures have similar food items. Also, Tarina, I will do the French voice as many times as you want me to. It is incredible to me how many different cultures have come to almost similar conclusions about different food items. And this, to me, is one of these. So, allergy is quite literally cheese grits. We're using corn, uh, specifically stone ground corn. And so guys, I need you all to tap in. I need to make sure that you're all listening. We're not using corn meal. We're not using corn flour. Well, we will be using, but that's not the base of it. We're using stone ground grits or stone ground corn. Uh, for allergy, traditionally, you would use white corn for this. Uh, do I have an answer for you? Why we're using white corn instead of yellow corn, etc.? I don't actually have an answer for you in that case. But we're looking for creamy white corn grits. And guess what, guys? We have exactly that. Okay, and so 
this is what we have. It's going to be great. It's going to be delicious. Um, it's going to be pretty wonderful. And so here is the order of operations for it. The first thing that we're going to do, we're going to be rinsing this out uh, because similar to cooking rice, we're looking to just sort of wash out the excessive starch on it. Uh, the second thing that we'll be doing is we're putting it into a pot, bringing it to a boil with four times its volume in water, and then we'll be cooking it for like 40 minutes. This is a process to get these kinds of grits done, my friends. It is a process. It's going to be a little bit of love. It's going to be a little bit of care. But Torino, we will be using some nixtamalized corn. And so let's talk about that. The reason why a largey almost differentiates from a lot of other different corn porridges or grits is because it has the addition of corn flour. So I did not buy corn flour. This was uh, masaharina, which is nixtamalized corn flour. And I already had this at home. And so I felt like I could use this instead of uh, just buying regular corn flour. Corn flour and nixtamalized corn flour are not actually interchangeable though. Nixtamalized corn flour is typically used to make tortillas. Um, it's used to make tortillas. It's used to make, you know, anything like uh, tamales or something, right? Uh, it's nixtamalized. So its flavor is much more intense. Its nutrition is a little bit higher than regular corn flour. So you can't use corn flour in substitution of this, but I have a feeling that we can use masa harina uh, in substitution of regular corn flour. In fact, I think the only difference is, is that we're going to get something significantly more, um, how do you say? I think it's just going to be a little bit more flavorful. And so this is red corn flour at that too. So guys, we're breaking all sorts of traditions right now. We're breaking all sorts of conventions uh, with the allergy that we'll be preparing. The actual boiling process for the allergy, my friends, it takes like 40 minutes or so. It is definitely substantial. Also, Natalie, thank you so much for the sub. Thank you, thank you. It is a substantial process. It is going to take some time. And so we got to rinse it out. We got to do a whole bunch of stuff to it. Uh, it's going to be a whole thing today. So are you guys, are you guys buckled up? Are you guys ready for this? Uh, because we, we're about to begin. Okay, and so the first thing that I'm going to do, my friends, is I'm just going to measure out roughly whatever is one cup of corn, uh, corn grits, that is. Um, I don't know, I believe like one portion is like, this might make like two to three batches, two to three portions of the stuff. I don't know. I have no idea how much this is actually going to produce for us, but I'm going to be started off by making one cup of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my bag opened. I'm struggling with opening a bag, so please forgive me. Happens to the best of us, I suppose. Okay, and let's go ahead and get one heaping cup of this cornmeal. Well, not cornmeal, excuse me. Stone ground white corn, my friends. Stone ground white corn. I'm using white corn grits, okay? So, one cup of this just goes directly in here. Well, I'm actually just going to, I think, wash it out directly in the pot itself, but I think that's okay. I should be using a slightly bigger bowl to wash this out in. And again, we're washing this out to get all the excess starch out. And then there's also going to be some of like the kernels that come up to the top that we're going to want to go ahead and get rid of. So this bad boy, I'm just going to go ahead and throw him into my pantry because we have no more use for him. I'm going to make sure that I have a bowl big enough to accommodate him. So just please forgive me. I'm going to take a second to go ahead and do that. And so guys, while I am washing the corn, um, I'm going to have to step out of frame. I'm going to have to go ahead uh, and get my chat over with me by the sink. So you're not going to see me that much. Um, so please be warned. But if anybody has any cooking questions, now is the time to do it. I want you to ask me any cooking questions that you may have. All that we're going to do is we're going to wash this stuff out until it's nice and clear. So guys, once again, I'm stepped out of frame. You're not gonna see me for a little bit. You're only gonna see my back. And in the meantime, I will be interacting with all of you. I will be talking with you as we're washing out the cornmeal. Okay, and we're going to be washing it the same way that we do rice, right? So we're just washing it out until the water runs nice and clear, my friends. Nice and clear. Okay, so just getting some nice cool water in there. Same exact idea as washing rice, guys until the water gun's clear. Put us down, chef. Any? I'm so sorry. There's time for uppies, I suppose. Okay, and then also, I know, some people said something about like, you have to catch all the ones that like float to the top. I don't know how true that is necessarily. I don't think it is. Get that back in there. Get that nice little wash. Um, okay, chef, if I may, if you make cro uh, croquettes, would you deep fry those bad boys or oven them? And so, Tarina, here is my answer for you. 
I do not deep fry at home because it is truly a significant, significant amount of effort. Deep frying at home is oftentimes a massive headache. And the reason it's such a big headache is because cleaning up all of that oil, I mean, it is just not for me. It is just not for my home routine. So if in a, I'm in a home setting, then I would probably bake the croquettes. However, I think deep frying a croquette would give you a much better flavor and texture. Serena, I'm gonna say right now, I think I'm a shallow fry hater. I think shallow frying gives you very inconsistent browning and it's like still a bit of a headache. At that point, I think I would just much rather uh, bake it. I think I would just bake it instead. Baking it just might be the way to go. Yeah, I've become like a real shallow fry hater. I don't know what it is, I'm just not about it. So guys, I'm just straining it off, I'm rinsing it off. We gotta keep going until the water is basically cleared. Okay, and that's how we stop, uh, stop it from being too gummy or anything. Okay, get that back in there. It's gonna be some time, it's gonna be some effort, it's gonna be some energy. Please forgive me throughout this process. I apologize for how long this is taking. And a couple more passes through. And so because it's also a lot finer than rices, it does make it also that much more of a headache to just wash all of it through. Okay. And get it all into the pot. One more pass through, guys. So any more questions that we have in the meantime? Again, I apologize for how long this is taking. And we're going to have to do the same thing with some rice. I know, guys. I know. I'm so sorry for this. Is it going to take a total like five or six total like washes through? Okay. And one last one. Hopefully. Hopefully. That is my hope. Any more cooking questions, please, to desperately keep me entertained while I'm doing this. Ooh, I ended up wasting some. That's okay. Some just fell out into the sink. That's fine. Happens to the best of us. Okay. So strained it all out. Got all my lovely cornmeal. Or rather my stone ground white corn. Okie dokie. Hi, Pain Pill. Welcome on in. Hope you're having a lovely day today. Okie dokie, guys. I have all of my corn now nice and washed and processed, and now it is ready to go into the pot. So, I'm back. Sorry about how long that took, my friends. And now we're going to get back into it. And so, let's go ahead and take a look at what we have here. Guys, this is roughly uh, one cup uh, volumetrically, right? One American cup, one empirical cup of uh, white corn. This is specifically white corn grits, okay? And so, we're going to go ahead and measure out. Um, I'm not going to do exactly four cups of water because I ended up losing some. Uh, as opposed to rice, I actually don't think the water proportions are nearly as important for something like this. Right? Whereas with rice, it's like you really want to make sure it's not getting overcooked. But because this is going to be uh, like super, super creamy and moved around, um, I'm going to do like three and a half cups of water. And so I'm measuring this out because it is my first time doing this dish. Because it's my first time doing this dish, guys, I'm going to go ahead and just be extra, extra cautious. So that's three, and now roughly like three and a half. Oh, I don't have enough to actually get half a cup. So let's go ahead and get some more. Three. And a little over half a cup. And I think that should be perfect. Okie dokie. Um, and so, anyway, I'm going to get to your question in just a second. But first and foremost, let's go ahead and get my lovely grits, my stone ground white corn, into the pot. Okay, and I'm grabbing a glove because uh, that's the only way I can actually properly, like, scoop it out of my strainer, is by, like, dislodging it with my hands. Okay? 
get all of it in them. Ooh, this strainer I don't think was even fine enough because a lot of the coins still ended up getting caught in it. Hmm, maybe a strainer was not a very good idea in retrospect, but that is okay. I just want to strain out the excess liquid from it. That was my only intention. Yeah, oh guys, it is stuck inside. That is absolutely stuck inside. So I'm gonna have to go ahead and properly wash that out. That's okay. And so guys, so similarly with rice, all we have to do is bring it up to a boil. We have to drop it to a simmer, and then we're going to be cooking it from 40 minutes to an hour. This process, guys, it takes time, it takes love, and it takes patience. And the reason why this grain takes so much time to cook is because it's stone ground. It's super coarse. It's super thick, okay? So, and then also we don't really have to worry about salting it now. We can always salt it up later, uh, especially because we'll be adding in some salty sulguni. The cheese that we're adding is innately salty, okay? Ooh, did I end up getting some on the floor? I think I did. That's okay. That's fine. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and throw this onto a nice medium heat or so, medium high heat. What is this accent? Passivism is just the way that I talk. So there you go. That's my snarky answer for you. Also, my real answer is that I have both a speech impediment and I'm from Brooklyn. That's my real answer. Okay, I just gotta wash out the strainer, guys, because it has all this cornmeal stuck in it. Ooh. All right. Just get all of that going. And so, guys, yeah, the cornmeal, it's really going to be probably like the most variable uh, long part. It's going to take quite a bit of time, but I promise you by the end of it, we're going to be left with something incredible and delicious and above all else, tasty. You thought it sounded British? Guys, do I sound British? I need, I need an answer right now. This is essential. Do I, do I truthfully, genuinely sound British to y'all? I ended up spilling some corn on the ground, so please excuse me. Yes, chef. Yes, chef, Serena. Unbelievable. I can't believe this. Terrible. You sound like you, chef. My favorite answer, Code Zero. I appreciate that a lot. Okay, I'm gonna get these spoons out of here because we're not going to need them for a good while. And I'm just going to go ahead and get another fresh spoon. And so guys, all that we're going to do, we're going to bring it up to a boil, we're gonna drop it to a simmer, and then every so often we're going to be stirring it. We don't need to stir it super aggressively until it gets really, really thick. And so, look at how much water is in this pot. It's full of water at the moment. I promise you, by the end of it, it's going to soak, it's going to drink all of that up, and we're going to get a very delicious, creamy, corn porridge, uh, corn grit thing, okay? It's going to be incredible. But in the meantime, we just gotta let it cook. We just gotta let it go. We just gotta let it do its thing. And so, let's go ahead and talk about and think about what else we need to get done for today. For the allergy, we have to also measure out some regular corn flour. In my case, I'm using masa harina. I think it's going to give it some additional flavor. And so guys, this is also a part of my thought on what it actually means to cook at home and what it means to actually localize things to your kitchen and the kinds of ingredients that you have available. This isn't traditional Georgian white uh, corn grits. This isn't American white corn grits. It's what I have available. I don't, I'm not going to go out of my way to also uh, buy corn flour when I already have a different type of corn flour at home. As long as you know how to substitute things, you can actually play around with the different regions and the different origins of ingredients that you actually have available to you. And so in my case, I'm going to be able to play around with this. I'm going to be able to play around with the corn flour aspect of it, um, as long as, again, stone ground corn and a type of corn flour. So let's go ahead and measure out some corn flour while we have a second. All right, and again, all we're doing is we're just bringing it up to a boil. I have here some lovely masa harina. Right? You can just use plain old corn flour, but it has to be fine, okay? And this corn is going to get added towards the end of the cooking process. It's going to give it a little bit of... It's going to make it a little bit stickier for us. And that is how allergy differentiates from a lot of other different kinds of, I guess, corn grit dishes. And so guys, I'm only going to need for one cup of corn, I'm going to do one and a half tablespoons of this flour. The amount that you actually use is entirely up to you, okay? Um, it depends on how sticky you want it. Um, and the corn flour itself is going to cook up really, really quickly. So I'm going to do one tablespoon and a half or so, something like that, right? And that should be enough food today, my friends. And so I'm going to go ahead and seal this up. 
And I'm really, really excited, guys. I'm so excited to see how this dish actually comes out today. I've never had a larji. I've had halucha many times before, but this is not a dish that I've ever, ever had. And so, I'm just really excited to see how it comes out. Okay, so that's my corn flour. That's all ready to go now. I'm going to go ahead and quickly wash out my uh, garlic press while I have a second of time. That beep sound, by the way, was my pressure cooker telling me that it has successfully built up pressure. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me at the moment? Okay, just getting my garlic press all washed up so that we can then just throw it into the dishwasher, guys. Remember, you gotta clean as you go. You gotta clean as you cook. Guys, you guys are so quiet today. I'm only upset a little bit. I was really excited about today. Okay. And I'll just get rid of that. Throw my spoon in there. Perfect. Okay, okay. So that's going. And again, this is gonna be a process. It's not going to take too much active time. We're just going to be going in there and stirring it occasionally. We have to get the rest of the ingredients for the harichal prepped. Um, we have to get the rest of the spices prepped for the harichal. So we have a lot of measuring, we have a lot of grinding, we have a lot of stuff that we can also just get done in the moment. We're just bringing this bad boy up to a boil. Okay, I'm just gonna give it a little stir around. Drop it to a simmer, and it's going to cook for a nice long time. It's going to gel up, it's almost going to gelatinize from all of the different starches in there. It's gonna thicken up nicely. It's gonna be beautiful. Okay, okay. So guys, uh, the next thing that I actually wanted to do, I wanted to uh, go ahead and blend up some tomatoes for the harichot today. So pacifism, uh, so I have a question for you in that case. You say you don't know much about cooking and you're super confused at the moment. Well, I have a question while you're watching the stream, I don't mean that to be like attacking you. And would you like to know more about cooking is my question. Because if you would like to, then guess what? I'm here to actually help you out. Okay, guys, I'm going to now be charring up and blending in some tomatoes. And so these tomatoes, they're going to be added closer to the end of the cooking process. And there's a reason for this. The tomato paste that we put into the pot, that's what's going to have a lot of the oomph. That's what's going to have a lot of the meatiness. But these tomatoes, these fresh tomatoes, I want to add them in towards the end to preserve some of the acidity. I want to preserve some of the acidity and some of the more floral notes of the tomatoes themselves. Because harichoa is a lot of balance between spiciness, herbs, meatiness, and then also the acidity element. And so we'll be finishing it off with these tomatoes and vinegar as needed. And so guys, uh, you also see a lot of harichu recipes. They use this traditional like Georgian sour plum sauce. Uh, I don't have any, but it's also just not completely essential. It's also up to you in the kind of harichu you're doing. So guys, we're going to be doing my patented char and blend method, okay? Uh, your girlfriend will be really happy. I'll try to bake a plan tomorrow evening. You'll follow the recipe and hopefully the best. So pacifism, I guess my question for you is, what is it, like, what are your goals with cooking? So, guys, these tomatoes, we're going to need to get the core out. We're going to be broiling them, charring them so we get the skin nice and smoky, and then we're going to blend it all down. So, all I'm going to do, guys, one by one, I slice each of my lovely little tomatoes in half, okay? And I'm going to show you exactly why. One of my least favorite things is seeing People try to dig out the core of the tomato with a paring knife and they go da 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 like that. When you do that, when you saw into the flesh of the tomato, you destroy the tomato flesh itself. You destroy the flesh of the tomato and you risk cutting yourself. What is so much easier, my friends, to get rid of that woody core is you just slice it in half and then you make two diagonal incisions, just like so. Two little diagonal incisions and pop it out. Nice and easy every single time. Okay, so let's do that with each of my lovely little tomato halves. One, two, and pop it out. One, two, and pop it out. And so guys, the goal isn't to really cook down the tomatoes. The goal is I'm trying to get a bit of smokiness in this. This is not a particularly traditional Georgian technique. This is something that I've taken from a lot of inspiration from Mexican cooking. This step of specifically charring your vegetables first, especially your tomatoes, your tomatillos, or your chilies, it adds a really, really beautiful smokiness into the final product. And so, 
I want to get some of that smokiness into the final product. Again, this is not something that is particularly native to Georgian cuisine, but I just love Mexican cooking and I love taking inspiration from it. So, pacifism. A flan is a kind of cake with pudding. I'm more used to bake cakes. Um, uh, flan does use flour, but milk. Yeah, it's kind of like a pudding, but it's a custard. A flan is a type of custard, really. Okay, guys, I'm just going to go in there and stir up my corn once again. This process of cooking, it's going to take a while. Let me go ahead and grab a little teeny tiny sheet tray. Oh, actually, my tiny sheet tray is being used up for the beef. So I'm going to have to use this one instead. And so, guys, we're heating up the top element of the oven. A broiler is something that not a lot of home cooks know how to use. The broiler is a super, super hot top element of the oven, and the goal of it is to either like melt some cheese to intentionally char something, or maybe you want to get like a crust on a steak really, really quickly. And so, this is one of my favorite uses for a broiler. If your oven doesn't have a broiler, or you don't have an oven, the traditional Mexican method is using a comal, which is a flat piece of metal, and you would just heat it up and just char it directly on that. You can do it on a cast iron pan. You can even do it on a nonstick pan with a little bit of oil. The goal, guys, once again, is just to blacken, is just to char up these tomatoes on the outside. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this into my oven. Guys, my corn is bubbling away. It is boiling, and you got to keep an eye on it. You have to babysit it. Underestimate a monkey, no oil whatsoever, I promise you. The reason why we don't actually broil with the uh, oil is because think about it this way. A tomato is wet. When the tomato cooks a little bit, it releases some of its water, the oil is right on top of it, it starts popping, and that popping goes directly into the fire above it. The oil would be if we were on a pan. And so because of the fact that the tomato is naturally wet in of itself, it would actually be a bit of a hazard. So guys, take a look. My corn, it's bubbling away now, and I promise you soon enough, this is going to become an incredible, delicious elogy. With just a little bit of time, with just a little bit of patience. Oof, beautiful. And so underestimated monkey, that's why. We gotta let those uh, tomatoes just naturally boil up. We're gonna get that skin nice and charred and smoky, and it's all going to be really, really incredible. It's all gonna be really, really delicious. Okay. So I'm just gonna wipe off my station really quickly. I'm gonna go rinse off my knife. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me at the moment? Um, Tarina, you ask me, I have a nonstick coated sheet pan. Is there a reason to get naked aluminum ones? Okay, okay, I have a thought. I have a thought. I'm gonna go on a food rant right now. I'm gonna go say something right now. Because this is a very, very important conversation topic for me at least. I have a lot of thoughts on the subject matter. So. Let me talk to you all. Is everybody ready? I want to hear Yes Chef right now. Please and thank you from everybody watching. I'm about to go on a food rant because this is some serious, serious business. I cannot believe the relationship between food influencers, TV chefs, food content creators for decades and selling people absolutely useless non-stick devices that they never ever needed to begin with. Guys, a baking sheet at the end of the day does not ever need to be non-stick. If you're making cookies, you put parchment. If you need it to be non-stick, you use like a, a, a silicone. You use a silicone pad. You can buy like a silicone pad on Amazon. You put that down and it's really, really nice and beautifully non-stick. A non-stick baking sheet is made with the crappiest, thinnest aluminum possible and it bends up immediately in the oven and it doesn't even give you good contact. It doesn't give you a good seal on things. It is, it just goes bad over time because guess what? Non-stick things are not meant to be heated at high temperatures for long amounts of time, especially in an oven setting where there's hot spots and cool spots, right? You're damaging that enamel over time. I only want plain aluminum baking sheets. You do not need, nobody needs a non-stick baking sheet. That's my rant. That's my rant for you today. Okay. Um, so that's my rant. And so it's fine if you use it. It actually just gives you bad browning. It gives you bad contact. It just doesn't do anything for you. So underestimate a monkey. You said, I am looking for a pan, a good pan, budget 300 bucks. I just need one pan that makes it all. Fry an egg, make a pancake, cook some bacon. So underestimate a monkey. Here's my problem for you. Different materials do different things exceptionally well. I would buy two pans or three pans. Um, I, think, I think everybody needs three pans in a household. 
The first pan you need is a nonstick pan. A nonstick pan, just something to fry an egg in, something to do low temperature cooking in. Okay, so, ooh guys, let's go ahead and just stir this up. My heat is too high. I want to lower this to a simmer. We're going to lower this to a simmer, guys, and we're going to occasionally stir this bad boy around to make sure it evenly cooks. We don't really need to cover it or anything. Okay, we're just going to be stirring it super, super often. Let's get all of that corn off my spatula, though. Okay, first thing you're going to need is a nonstick pan. I personally think that most Teflon-coated pans are the same. I would get a really cheap tea fowl. The second pan that you need is a non-reactive stainless steel pan. This is for your sautéing. This is for 90% of uses. I would get a clad stainless steel pan. Let me show you the one that I have. I have here a Mavier. This Mavier has a coil of aluminum inside of it for added conductivity and stainless steel on the outside. Stainless steel on the outside so that it's not reactive. And this is what you're going to do a majority of your cooking in. I would buy, if you have that kind of a budget, I would buy an all clad. I would buy a five layer all clad. A five layer all clad, stainless steel on the outside, aluminum, copper. It has the best heat conductivity. I love all clads. Get the five uh, all clad. Okay? So that's what I would get. Um, after that, I would get a pan for searing things, right? If we talk about like pans, right? Not like pots. I would get like a carbon steel or a cast iron if you trust yourself enough to actually take care of one. And so those are my recommendations for you. So guys, take a look. This guy is getting certified gloopy. We want to make sure that he's simmering and not too hot because it's going to start splashing. My porridge, my lovely allergy is becoming certified gloopy. And so let's also go ahead and check on my lovely little tomatoes. Let's go ahead and see how charred they've become. I can smell them. We're looking for the tomato skins to get nice and blackened. And that, guys, is exactly what I was looking for. Let's go ahead and take that out and let's cool it off before we blend it. Take a look, my friends. These are my charred up tomatoes. Okay, and these bad boys are going to be added towards the end. This right here, this corn aspect, guys, this is going to take some time and some love and some energy. Okay, you got to stir it around every once in a while. Just make sure it's not sticking to the bottom. I love using a nonstick pot for something like this. Just give it time and it's going to become delicious. You see how it's like splashing up? That's because my heat is a little bit too high because of how much surface tension it has, because of how viscous it's become. The air bubbles, the air bubbles, as they pop out, pop out incredibly aggressively. So in order to make sure it doesn't splash all over your kitchen, guys, a nice low, 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 low heat and often stirs, okay? Just stir it up and let that bad boy continue and do its thing. It's going to cook up, it's going to take time, but I promise you it's going to be delicious at the end of it. I haven't made grits in a very long time. I've never made a large before. And so I'm relearning a lot of the different grits fundamentals, okay? It just takes time, guys. It takes time, it takes effort. You just gotta be patient, okay? So tomatoes are charred, grits are going now. Let's go ahead and do some of the other prep that we need to get done for today, my friends. Actually, I'm gonna throw my cheese back into the fridge. Okay, dokie. So, um, let's measure out some of the spices that we need for today, guys. So, one of the most important Georgian spices, guys, is this bad boy right here. These are savory leaves, also sold as summer savory. We're going to be adding in savory leaves, um, and I'm going to do at least, like, I want to do a couple of teaspoons in here. I want my stew to be nice and aromatic and herbaceous. So let's go ahead and get that measured out. Now, I'm going to do like maybe like a tablespoon of summer savory. Again, the traditional spice blend to use would be uh, Canelli Sunelli. Okay, Canelli Sunelli or Camelli Sunelli? I forgot which one it is. Which has marjoram, it has some basil, it has some other stuff in it. I don't have that, but I promise you guys, everything is going to be nice and herbaceous today. I'm going to be using roughly a tablespoon and it's entirely up to you how much you wanna be using. So that's half a tablespoon and that's one tablespoon. There you go. All of those, eh, that's a lot. I'm looking at that amount now and I'm like, that's a lot. Okay, next step, guys, is going to be some freshly ground coriander seeds. So once again, I'm going back to my pot and I'm stirring up all of this cornmeal. The cornmeal, by the way, without the cheese is called a uh, homi, right? So it's like a G and an H sound, like a homi. And then with the cheese, it becomes a large. Okay, slightly larger heat probably would be okay now, I think. I don't think it's gonna splash up. Okay, lovely. So guys, let's go ahead and use my favorite tool, the humble, the one and only, the mortar and pestle. 
and let's go ahead and get a bunch of fresh coriander seeds. Because guys, guess what? Pre-ground spices have less flavor than freshly ground spices. Okay? Because of the fact that the flavors in a spice are both light and oxygen reactive, a pre-ground spice loses more flavor over time. And so I'm going to do a bunch. I'm going to do in total, maybe one tablespoon of coriander seeds, guys. I want my stew today to be herbaceous. I want it to be full of flavor, I want it to be full of herbs, and it begins with my dried herbs. Okay, so let's go ahead and take all my coriander seeds and let's grind it ourselves. Guys, if you don't have a mortar and pestle, you can invest in a spice grinder, aka just a coffee grinder. I really think that everybody should get into the habit of doing this at home. You get so much more flavor, you have so much more control. Can I please get a yes, chef, from everybody watching? Please and thank you, from everybody. No slacking allowed. So what I'm going to do first, guys, is I'm just going to first crush it to make sure that none of the seeds fly out of my mortar. Right, because as you see, because of the fact that they're circular, they'll just end up popping out. I don't think that's enough yes, chefs. I do mean it when I say I want everybody to give me one. I'm going to go in here, I'm going to stir up all of those lovely grits. Stir it up, get it going, beautiful. Oh, it's going, guys. It's going to be delicious. Chat snoozing today. That's right. I have no idea how many people are watching today either, but chat is, is resident sleepy. Okay. And I'm grinding it up, and I'm grinding it up, and I'm getting it done, my friends. So I just had something to check on. Okay, okay. And let's just continue, guys. We're just squashing all of the round seeds. Any of the ones that still look, look like they're round and intact, that's the ones that we're really looking to get rid of. And also, by the way, you don't really have to fry dried herbs. Uh, when it comes to other kinds of uh, dried spices, things like cumin, things like chilies, those are really nice to fry, but these will all be added towards the end, relatively, of the process. Okay, let's go ahead and crush all of my coriander seeds up first. And then once they're crushed, guys, we're just going to go through and grind it up and grind and grind in big circular motions, guys, until we obtain a nice, fine powder. My harichot today, everybody, it's going to be full of flavor. It's going to be full of seasonings. It's going to have so much love and affection and care put into it that you guys have no idea. Oh, maybe my heat is a little too low now. Let's keep it cooking, guys. We got to keep it cooking. We got to keep it all going. Okay, get all of that coriander underground up and now the smell is hitting you, right? Nice and herbaceous, nice and floral. Beautiful. A little bit more, my friends. We just want to be able to get a nice, fine powder. What is jingling? Something is like jingling. And I have no, oh, is it my metal cups? I think it's my little condiment cups. Every time I'm grinding it and my table is shaking, it's the condiment cups. Okay, guys, let's get all of this stuff into a nice, beautiful, fine powder. Keep it going, keep it rotating, keep it grinding. And we're just looking to get like no husks, right? Because it's going to give us a bit of an unpleasant mouthfeel inside. Okay. And I think that should be okay for us today, guys. Ah, maybe a little bit more. I don't think that was ground fine enough. I would really like to get an electric spice grinder at some point, though. I do think that would be pretty good for me to have. Okay. Ooh, this guy is bubbling away once again. We're going to give it a nice big stir. Make sure, again, it's not popping out too much. It's becoming nice and thick and creamy. And it takes time, my friends, because those uh, the actual grains of the corn, they're super, super big. They're super, super thick, so it takes time for us to get it to the consistency that we want it. Okay, and almost done. Beautiful, and I think that should be okay for us today. Let's just go ahead and get this dumped into the same container as all of my summer savory. Beautiful. So guys, summer savory and coriander seeds, nice and aromatic, but then we're also going to get a bunch of fresh herbs in for today. So let me go ahead and put that away. Um, again, this is the corn flour that's going to be added for the allergy. These are my spices that's going to be for the harcha. This is my raw garlic that I'm going to add towards the harcha as well. Okay, and now let's think about what else 
actually needs to get done in the moment. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my tablespoon measure because I no longer need it. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw that bad boy into the dishwasher. We're letting the tomatoes cool down before we blend it. And now, what else actually needs to go into today's stew? We have some celery, my friends. So let's go ahead and get this bad boy nicely and finely chopped up. I'm looking for the very finely chopped celery because of the fact that it's only going to boil for about 20 minutes or so, we need it to cook quickly. So everybody, little tip. If you're eating raw celery, I need everybody to tap in. And you ever notice those super, super fibrous long strands? All you gotta do when you're prepping celery, break off a little piece and you're just going to peel it back. And all of these guys, these are the super, super tough celery fibers that are giving you trouble. These bad boys right here. And so it doesn't really matter in a cooked context, but getting rid of it in a raw context, especially in a salad, pickled celery, or eating it with like buffalo wings or something, guys, promise you, this is going to give your eaters a much better experience. So we get rid of those, even though it's completely unnecessary for this. And now guys, we're going to go ahead and get a nice, beautiful, fine, fine dice. I'm just going to go back and stir up my corn. Again, just making sure nothing is sticking to the bottom. I'm aggressively stirring it. I'm stirring up the sides as well. I'm going to probably switch over to a silicone spatula now, just so I can really, really scrape up the sides of it. Okay, get all of it unstuck, all of it unstuck from the sides. Just nice, big, aggressive stir, my friends. It takes time. Okay, it takes time, it takes 40 minutes, it takes an hour sometimes to get you the texture and the consistency that you are looking for, okay? So just give it time and be nice and patient, and I promise you, your patience will be properly rewarded. Okay, so guys, let's go ahead and continue with the celery chopping. So all I'm going to do is we're going to get this bad boy into some really, really nice, super, super thin lengths, right? So I'm just cutting it just like this, and I'm rotating the celery as I go. Thin, thin, thin. Thin is the key to this, guys. Because again, I'm not looking for chunks of celery in today's harcho. I'm just looking for it to make it nice and aromatic. And thus, we need nicely and finely chopped up celery. So thin, 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 thin. Guys, how are we cutting it? I want to hear a thin chef from everybody right now. Please and thank you. Celery is everywhere in Georgian cooking. I love celery. Or rather, I don't actually think I used to love celery this much, um, but I, I've, I've, I've just become like a, a real celery guy as of late. I used to be a celery hater. I don't, I don't know why. I think it was just something I used to say. Yeah. Give that a little stir. Just scrape all of that stuff off. Beautiful. Okay, and let's head back to the celery guys. So we're going to do the same exact thing with this bad boy right here, just move that to the side. Nice and thin, 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 thin. All the way through, all the way around the celery. Is it bursting? Oh, it's, it's popping. Guys, the heat on this thing is so fickle. I like move it like a millimeter in one direction and it's too low. I move it a millimeter in the other direction, it's too hot. I don't want it popping, I don't want it bursting. Let's get all of this stuff nicely and beautifully incorporated inside. Again, guys, a nonstick pot works wonders for this. I would not probably do this in a stainless steel pot. Your risk of scorching it is that much higher. This is one of the few times that I really recommend using a nonstick pot. There's very few uses for one. This is definitely one of them. I like using a stainless steel pot for rice sometimes because I like it when it sticks and squishes and gets crispy, but this is not one of those dishes because the goal is to make it creamy. Okay guys, now that we have our celery bunch here, all that we're going to do is we're going to take it and we're going to stack it up and we're going to cut it nice, thin little pieces, my friends. Claw grip, we're pinching with our pinky and our thumb. We're gently putting down the rest of our hand on top. Okay, and we're going through this and we're getting a nice, Fine, fine dice on the celery, guys. Again, I want my celery to cook into today's stew properly, okay? Because in fact, it's not sauteing, it's not pressure cooking. We need to get this bad boy cooked in time. Okay. All of my celery, guys. Does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? 
I know today's just a chill little Wednesday stream, but guys, I'm really, really excited about today's dish. Today's dish is a halucha. This is a dish that I grew up eating so much in Georgian restaurants. So actually, let me talk about this for a second. Georgian food is almost criminally not understood, or rather, I feel like when it comes to uh, the global culture, uh, or at least, I guess, the American perspective of a lot of different things, right, especially with restaurant culture, what do we know a lot about? I feel like we know a lot about American Italian food. We know a little bit about French food, right, on a global culinary scale. We know about Italian food, we know about French food, we know about certain regions of Chinese cooking, we know a lot about Japanese cooking now, um, and we know about Mexican cooking. But past that, guys, here's the thing. People do not understand that the common knowledge, I need you all to listen to this because this is really important. The common knowledge and the common understanding of all the different cultures and all the different foods, a lot of it has to do with class and history of immigration. So let me tell you like the moment that this really, really sunk in for me. Uh, I was in France because I was commentating a smash event. Right? I was there to commentate a smash event. And so I looked around and there were Algerian restaurants. And never in my life, up until that point, I live in New York. We don't have like a big community of Algerian immigrants. We don't have Algerian restaurants here. Maybe there's a couple of them. I knew nothing about Algerian food. I just knew that Algeria was a place. But there it was in France, several Algerian restaurants. And then it really, really clicked for me. The world, and this might sound so obvious, the world is such a big place. But the only reason why we know about certain different cultures culinarily and not others is not because one is better than another, it's because of the way that immigrants shape different communities. Similarly, there's almost no Georgian communities in the United States. My part of Brooklyn, my very specific part of Brooklyn, got a lot of Georgian immigrants during the collapse of the USSR. And as a result, New York has gotten a taste of really good, amazing mainland Georgian cuisine. But this is not something the rest of the country knows about. When I went to California, I was surprised by the amount of Japanese restaurants and the um, different types of Japanese food that was there and the quality of the Mexican cooking there. And I was like, whoa, this is nothing like the East Coast. And so the reason why people don't know about certain cultures or cuisines is because it's extremely relative to the immigrant communities that occupy different places and it's extremely dependent on history. And as a result, a lot of places over time, even if none of us, you know, in this chat, all of us, you know, nice, respectful people, none of us would say, oh, this is the best cuisine. It became known as like, oh, Italian food is a high cuisine. French cooking is a high cuisine. But there is so many incredible cuisines that just aren't represented, guys. And that is one of the coolest things, I think, that we live in such a big world. There's so many different cuisines. There's so many different cultures. And each of them have so much history and theory. It's just that even, like, a lot of them don't have a lot of knowledge. Guys, if you try to look up Georgian recipes on the internet, you get uh, maybe food travel. Oh, hey, camera, what are we doing? Can, can we fix ourselves? Guys, if you look up Georgian recipes on the internet, you don't get a lot of resources. In fact, you get a lot of not so good ones as well. You get a lot of not amazing resources that kind of give you incorrect information written by white people. There is so much stuff out there that actually isn't known, that actually isn't uh, archived that particularly well. And so, Georgian cooking is, in my mind, one of those things. To the Western world, not a lot of people even know about the country of Georgia. There's so much incredible influence from the Middle East, from Eastern Europe, from China, and from Western Europe. All of it mashes together in Georgian cuisine. You have kinkali, which are these um, incredible dumplings, essentially, right? You have this incredible vegetarian culture um, because of how, like, meat historically was really, really expensive. And so that's why I think it's just so cool, guys. That's why I just think food and how it relates to the world and all the different immigrant communities. There is a lot more food out there than we will ever know because of how many different places have access to different technology, how many different communities ended up immigrating to, you know, Western countries and which ones didn't. All of it is so circumstantial, my friends. And even then, the Italian cooking that we know about, I have a lovely Italian friend and the way that she described to me as Italy is a very new concept. Italian culture is basically an amalgamation of a lot of different islands and a lot of different subcultures and languages that were kind of forced into one. As a result, regional Italian cooking is only in the last 20 years actively being explored on a global scale. Because Italian cooking isn't always, you know, this American Italian, which was shaped by a lot of Neapolitan and Sicilian immigrants in the United States. 
it's not always uh you know like uh like super super like heavy pastas and tomatoes and all of this other stuff guys there is so much to italian cooking that people do not know about there's so many different kinds of like pizzas that would be eaten at home like really thick pies right and just people do not know about it and so I just think that is so cool that our understanding of different cuisines is entirely dependent on history and immigration and all these other factors, guys. And thus, we have Georgian cuisine. So thank you for listening to my extended rant. I just wanted to really like, I don't know, every time I think about all of the different uh, cultures and cuisines out there, guys, it reminds me that the world is such a massive, massive place. It reminds me that the world is a massive place, that we exist in the context of others, and that our history and our understanding of history is only relative to the places that we've been taught it. And I just think that is so cool. I think it is one of the coolest concepts ever. You know? So, that's all. And all I'm saying is, guys, you know what's a really, really fun approach to food? Look up a country that you know nothing about. Look up a country that you know nothing about. Stop thinking about just Chinese, Italian cooking. Or if you're doing that kind of cooking, think about what people in that country eat at home. The way that I approach now trying to really expand my understanding of food is I try to go around and think, what do these different cultures and people eat at home specifically, right? Um, and, and that's a really good way of understanding it because the kind of information that you'll find on the internet is also extremely relative to whoever wrote it. Ask somebody from that culture, ask where they're from. Seriously, ask them the kind, even if they don't cook, ask them the kind of things they grew up eating. This is something that I did with some of my Southern friends. For, I'll give you guys an example. I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in the Northeast. I knew nothing really about like what people ate at home in the South. Like, of course you would know like fried chicken, collard greens, that kind of a thing. But I was always confused about how you would eat a biscuit. Is that like you eat it like a dinner roll? Do you eat it in sandwiches? What times of the day do you eat it as? And so I knew a couple of uh, Southern girls off of Twitter. And so I asked them, did you, grew up, uh, did you grow up eating this? Is this something that your family made, right? Is this something that your family made? What were the times that you've eaten it? And so, you don't have to necessarily ask them how it was prepared. You just want to ask them about their experiences of that thing. Uh, do I look for cultural touchstone dishes? Dishes of any uh, class would eat. So sensorial, that's a very good question. Touchstone dishes are very dependent on each culture. Harcho is one of those things that everybody in Georgia eats when there is meat available. For the poor, this would be a little bit more celebratory. For, well, historically at least. Now, everybody, you know, the actual like people are a little bit wealthier in Georgia now than they used to be historically um but something like harcho is something that everybody would eat um and so I'm not really interested in only food that the rich people would eat so I only look for yeah I, I like food that is universal but I'm typically looking for the food that is historically of the people that is the kind of food that always will interest me the most um okay so uh and he says a few years ago I had a roommate who was Peruvian and one who was Ukrainian and one of my best food experiences um, from them cooking staples at home. Absolutely. What we're doing right now, guys, we're cooking a staple. We're cooking a largy. We're cooking this corn porridge low and slow. This is the kind of a thing that people are eating at homes. And that is what is so cool about it. We're giving it a nice, big, aggressive stir, guys. We're getting it all of it nicely stirred up. Beautiful. Right, just continuing to let that whole thing cook up. But guys, I just, I don't know, I just think cuisine and history and culture, all of it is so, so, so incredible. There is so much to cooking. The best way to really learn is, again, look up a country you know nothing about and start asking people from those cultures, what did you eat at home? Are there cuisines that nobody should look into? Tarina, I wouldn't say that. I would not say that. I would say that a lot of cuisines are very developed in terms of like class and culture and history. Um, there is no such thing as an objectively bad cuisine, though. That just, that does not exist, right? And to imply otherwise, to imply that there is such a thing, even in the context of English things, uh, a lot of anthropologists would argue that it's a very dangerous line of thinking. Uh, I'll give you guys an example. With Brazilian cooking, there wasn't a lot of Brazilian restaurants in Brazil. Brazil has access to some of the most incredible ingredients and produce. But for the longest time, Brazil didn't really have Brazilian restaurants because people only viewed Italian cooking within Brazil as being superior. And thus, in, again, the last 20, 30 years, a lot more Brazilian restaurants popped up. Um, is Georgian food closer to Mid Middle Eastern or European? So, Cloud9, it's kind of hard to say because it's genuinely all over the place. Like, the traditions, uh, especially with, like, the skewering meat, is incredibly Middle Eastern, right? Um, it's just all over the place. So, I can't, like, say which one it's more than the other. 
So I, I don't really know how to say, you know, in which direction it's going there. Okay, guys, this is getting now nice and properly gloopy. You can tell that it's getting nice and cooked because it's gelatinizing, right? It's becoming really nice and thick. All of that corn has soaked up the water, okay? And now, uh, let's go ahead and proceed with the rest of the ingredients for today, guys. I have here my suluguni cheese. Uh, again, if you don't have access to sulguni, that is completely and totally okay, my friends. You can quite literally just use mozzarella for something like this. Oh, excuse me. A lot of these cheeses, Oaxacan cheese, mozzarella cheese, uh, suluguni cheese, they're basically the same thing. Maybe some differences in the amount of fat and some differences in the amount of salt. Suluguni is S-U-L-U-G-U-G-U-N-I. Suluguni. Okay. So guys, if you don't have access to suluguni, and the reason why I have suluguni is because, again, I live in an Eastern European area, uh, or rather, we also have a lot of Georgian immigrants here, so thus I have access to this cheese. And so guys, we're going to go ahead and just grate it up. Uh, here's my advice for grating something, guys. We're going to keep my box grater nice and flat like this, and then we're going to be pushing it away from us. If we did it standing, all of the cheese falls onto the cutting board and we have to pick it out. So instead, I just really want to do it like this, we get these big, beautiful shreds of cheese, my friends. Big shreds of cheese, big shreds. And I'm going to be using up all of that cheese. The goal for today, guys, was to use up my leftover suluguni, and thus it's going to go into my incredible allergy. And so guys, take a look. Because we did this horizontally, we pick it up and we just scoop it onto the plate. It makes our lives so, so much easier. Does anybody have any cooking questions? So I apologize for the long, like romantic tangent, right? About like food and food cultures and all of that. But it's just, this is something that has just been exciting me so much. And it's something that I'm always going to be pursuing and learning about as time goes on. Okay, it's looking wonderful, guys. It's looking lovely. We gotta keep it cooking though. Cause that minimum 40 minutes is still not concluded, okay? So it takes time. So. Yeah, it still smells good. I was just checking. Grate up all of the cheese, guys. And again, I'm not measuring anything today. I'm just using half a block of sulguni. You might just use however much mozzarella that you would like. There is no set amount. You can make it as cheesy as you would like. I just want to use up my leftover cheese. So thus, today, my uh, allergy is going to be incredibly cheesy. It's going to be creamy, and it's going to be stretchy, and it's going to be sticky. Okay? So let's go ahead and continue grating it up. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me at the moment? The beef is almost done cooking. We're going to do, do the uh, second cooking, right? Which is cooking it down, adding in the herbs, adding in the spices, all of that good stuff, my friends. All of that will still be happening soon. And we also got to blend the tomatoes. Oof. Let's get all of this cheese, guys. All of it, every last bit of it. I want it pushed through the grater. I want it nicely and beautifully grated up, okay? Got a drive? All right, Tuna. Well, thank you for being cute. Just push it through, push it through, push it through, push it through. And guys, if your cheese crumbles too much, uh, my advice is always you can just throw it into the freezer for a little bit of time. Throw it in the freezer, and that should take care of it. Okay. So that's that. And um, because all the cheese is going to melt in anyways, it's fine if you have some big pieces. Just grating it is going to help out uh, with the process faster. Okay, guys. Last little chunk of sulguni. Is everybody watching? I want to hear a nice yes, chef. Please and thank you. Let's grate it up. Let's get the last of it done, my friends. Almost done. Just pushing it through. Getting the last few shreds. Getting the last few granules. Yes, chef from everybody. Also, welcome on in, uh, Shazio. First time? How'd you find the show? Okay, guys. All of my cheese is now great and ready to go. Also, by the way, if you would like to support what I do, if you would like to help me continue this cooking show, guys, please support me on Patreon. You can type in exclamation mark Patreon. Guys, with this cooking show concept, I don't want to take sponsors. I don't want to run advertisements. Twitch will force me to run advertisements in the beginning, but I've disabled all other advertisements. I believe that information in this day and age should be free because we have the technology to do it. And so the way that I actually make that kind of a model work is if you have the money to help support this kind of a stream, you can subscribe, you can go onto the Patreon, right? Um, but if you don't, guess what? This is still going to be around and this is still going to be free for everybody to watch. I very strongly believe in sliding scale models, right? And so people that benefit from cooking shows, right? People that benefit from learning how to cook at home are the ones that typically have a little bit less money. And thus, I never want to have 
um, like paywalled content. I never want to sell people information. I want to have the information be out there and free. And thus, if you have a little bit of excess money, if you have a little bit of excess pocket change, I ask you to help me out on the Patreon to help keep this show running because I would like uh, to be able to do this full time one day. So guys, I'm going to continue just stirring this up. I'm going to continue mixing out my allergy, get all of it into the pot. Even the dried out bits, I promise you, they'll dissolve right back into all of the liquid. Beautiful. And actually it doesn't look that beautiful, but it is a staple, guys. This is just a staple grain. It is just plain old corn. Ooh, that sign, guys, that is the pressure cooker being done now. So I'm going to get the rest of this corn back into the pot. Okay. And let's turn off my pressure cooker, guys. And then we're going to go ahead and inspect the beef. So I'm going to just move aside my plate of beautiful cheese. Move that aside, set that behind me. Okay, let's get all this cheese off of my table. And then guys, we're going to go ahead and release the pressure cooker. Um, so the pressure cooker has been going for 40 minutes. The beef should now be nice and tender. And so we're releasing the pressure and we're gonna go ahead and take a look at it. Okay, I'm just gonna grab a wet paper towel to clean up my station. Wipe off my table, wipe off my counter, wipe off my station. Lovely. Okie dokie. So, the allergy is cooking. The beef is just about ready to come out. Beautiful. So what else do we need to do, my friends? We need to go ahead and we need to blend up all of my charred tomatoes. So let me go ahead and get that transferred over into my blending cup. Um, also, by the way, let's talk about blender safety for a second, guys. So I had to intentionally cool down my tomatoes. The reason I had to cool down my tomatoes was because this is a closed blender. This is like a ninja bullet, okay? If I put something hot in here, it would just end up bursting out because it's a closed system. If you have a Vitamix you, or like any other open top blender, you can blend something when it's hot. In this case, not so much. So guys, I'm just gonna go ahead and drop each of my tomatoes inside. My lovely charred uh, plum tomatoes here. Again, I'm used like these plum tomatoes just because they're really, really cheap. They're really affordable and they also have a lot of flesh so they're not too watery. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and just throw this into my blender, guys, until it's nicely pureed. Does anybody have any questions? I want to hear a nice yes, chef, from everybody watching. If you're still watching, if you're still giving me your attention and time. Gerbils, welcome on in. Um, I'm not going to show you the blending process, guys. I'm just going to do that off cam. I'm going to get that done in a second. It takes just a moment. Guys, guess what? We have acquired our lovely pureed tomatoes, and this is just going to be added into the stew. It's gonna make it nice and acidic. It's going to add a very nice, delicious flavor into the whole thing, and so we can go ahead and set that aside. My friends, also, thank you so much, Red Shirt, for the sub. It's that time of the month, I suppose. Welcome on in. It's lovely to have you. My friends, are you all ready to see the beef stew? It's about to come out. It's almost done cooking. I am also going to just quickly taste uh, my corn and porridge just to see how it's going. Also, thank you for the $10. Whoa. Well, thank you for the $10 donation. It's very sweet of you. Guys, we're about to go ahead and take a look. I'm just going to go ahead and first taste my corn porridge, my grits. Mm. Almost all of the raw corn taste is gone. It's almost to where it needs to be, guys but I'm going to be transferring it over to a different burner because on that one, that's where the uh, stew is going to go. So my friends, let's go ahead and have a little look at my pressure cooker pot. Let's look at the beef stew. 
and my beef should have gotten nicely and beautifully tend to my foots. Okay, Ugh. big pot, it's going. There she is, my joy. My lovely, incredible beef stew, my friends. And so now we have to go ahead and get all of this trans food inside of my Dutch oven. Because this is where its, its final resting place will be. This is where we'll get all of the cooking done, my friends. So let's go ahead and get that started. That is my beef stew. And so very, very gently, let's get all of that cooking liquid, all of the broth, everything from the pressure cooker pot into this bad boy. And so once it gets to about this volume, I'm going to just start scooping out the chunks so this doesn't splash all over my kitchen. And guys, the beef should be nice and tender. I'm going to be turning on a heat. We're going to get it to a boil. We're going to drop it to simmer. We're going to be reducing all of this cooking liquid down. We're going to concentrate all of those flavors. Okay, so let's get all of this beautiful beef inside my friends. And I'm going to also start picking out the bay leaves. Okay, because we don't want any bay leaves in the final product. The beef, guys, the beef should be nice and tender. It should be delicious now, okay? In fact, I think I'm just going to take out a chunk of beef just to make sure that it is as tender as it should be. I'm not looking for it to be completely fall apart, my friends. Um, but I am not looking for it to be so tough that we, of course, can't chew through it. And so, let's go ahead and just take a little piece of beef out. I'm gonna let that cool off for a second and then we'll come back to it. So let's get all of the solids, everything inside of my pot, guys. Everything, everything inside, nice and proper. Oop, those are some bay leaves that we do not want. That's one, and that's two. There you go. And let's get the rest of it, guys. I know it's a little tedious, I know it's a little laborious, but we have no bones, we have nothing that we have to get rid of from the pressure cooker pot itself. We just want to get all the beef chunks inside. Okay, I see some more bay leaves that we can go ahead and detach, that we can remove. Almost done, my friends. We're going to get this whole mixture cooked down, boiled down, reducing, we're going to get nice and intense. Is everybody still watching? I want to hear your chef. There you go. That should be the last of it. And let's get all of that cooking liquid back inside. There she is, my friends. That is the start of a beautiful hocho. Okay. That is now going. I'm going to go ahead and stir up my allergy again. Just make sure that it's all evenly cooking. Ah, gorgeous. Okay. Stir up my pot. And again, I'm just continuing to cook that on a nice low heat. My friends, this is the start of a delicious haucho. We have this big, big, beautiful pot of stew at the moment. So let's go ahead with our first addition, which is going to be all of the tomatoes. The goal, my friends, is to cook out the excess liquid because you can see how liquidy the soup is. We're going to concentrate all of those delicious beefy flavors. We're going to get all of that stuff done, but it's going to take a little bit of time and it's also going to take a little bit of patience. So let's go ahead and get in my lovely tomato puree. And let's also go ahead and get in my celery, my friends. Let's add the celery and a nice high heat now because all we're looking to do is boil, boil, boil. My celery goes in. My tomatoes go in. And last but not least, my friends, let's get those spices inside. So remember my savory and my coriander seeds, all of that goes in. It's going to make the whole thing nice and rich and aromatic. So let's mix everything back on in. And don't worry about the salt, guys. We can always add the salt at the end of this kind of a stew. We're not going to add it right now because we're going to lose a lot of water volume. We're going to lose a lot of that volume. We're gonna lose a lot of that liquid. Okay, so this, guys, is going to take some time. We need to boil this. We need to bubble it away really, really aggressively. Can I please get a yes, chef, from everybody watching? And in the meantime, let's go ahead and have, I think I just had too much water in my pressure cooker pot. While that's going, while that's cooking, I'm going to just go ahead and have a little just taste. Guys, you can see the beef just pulls apart. 
Mm. Exactly what I was looking for. It's not so tender that it falls apart into shreds, but it still shreds up really nicely when you pull it. Nice and tender. That's what I'm looking for. Let's get that in my pot. Mm. Mm. Excellent. And even by itself, guys, that is so beefy. That is so flavorful. Even without anything in it like that, and it's only going to get better as time goes on. That I can promise you. Okay. So I'm just stirring up my allergy one more time. And then we're about to add in the corn flour. And so that process is going to be a little bit more laborious. Oof, we have a lot to do, my friends. This process is still nowhere done yet. <sighs> a lot has to get done. A lot needs to get done. You know what? In the meantime, while this is boiling and while this is reducing, um, I think actually... So chat, I have a question. Do you think we should do the harcho with rice? Traditionally, you would add in some rice, but because of the fact that I'm going to be eating this with a porridge, I'm kind of feeling like I don't want any rice in mine. I think we should do ours without the rice. Yeah, I'm gonna do mine without the rice today, even if it is traditional to do it with, um, because I will be eating it with another grain. Um, I just don't think I really, really want like that much starch in something like this. I think that's going to be completely unnecessary. Okay. Let's do riceless. This is going to be a riceless harcho. This is going to be a riceless beef stew. I'm going to go ahead and go on over to the stove, guys. And while this is boiling away, I'm actually going to be switching the stove that it's on. And the reason for that, the reason why I'm choosing to do that, guys, is because we're about to move on with the next step of the elargy. So that one's going on on a high heat. This one I'm dropping down. Nice low heat, guys. Once again, the elargy. We got it to this stage of the process, okay? And so now, we're about to add in the corn flour itself. And that's going to be another 7 to 10 minutes of cooking before we add in the cheese component, everybody. So, we're going to give it another taste. We just want to make sure that it tastes fully cooked through. We don't want any greens inside that are too toothsome. We don't want anything that's too tough in there. And we don't want any, like, raw grain taste. Okay? So, I'm going to go ahead and dip my spoon in. Have a little taste. Mmm. Yeah. That is exactly what it needs to be. Right? Again, it's nice and creamy on the inside, but we're not tasting any of like the raw greens. We're not getting any raw chunks in there. And so everybody, here's what we're going to do now. This next step is going to take a lot of mixing. It's going to take a lot of stirring. I need to make sure that you're all tapped into this. In fact, I might even take with me the iPad and set it down right here so I can always watch you guys. I'm always watching. Okay. So while the beef stew is bubbling and boiling and evaporating away, guys, we're turning up the heat to a medium now. Okay. And we're adding in all of the corn flour. Again, today I'm using this red masa harina because that's what I already had at home. And we want to stir super aggressively. We want to stir it up. We don't want to have any clumps of flour inside, my friends. We're stirring all of it up, and this is going to get it to be a little bit pasty. It's going to be nice and sticky. So how do I memorize them? Um, so Cloud9, this is not a dish that I've ever made before. Before we did the stream today, I referenced a lot of different people. Okay? So, guys, we're stirring it in. We're stirring it in really, really aggressively. We're making sure that we have absolutely no lumps. And to get rid of the raw flour taste, this is going to be about seven minutes of cook time. This is the difficult part. It's going to get thicker. It's going to get slightly gummier. Okay? But we just have to stick with it, everybody. Just stick with it, and it'll be perfect. Ugh. Just stir it all in. Mix it in. The masa harina is also just going to make it so much more flavorful than regular corn flour will. So it's going to be really, really delicious, guys. Okay. Back to this. Again, it's on a medium heat so that we can really properly cook out the corn that we just added in. Ooh, it's a lot of effort, my friends. It's a lot of work. But I promise you, it will be well worth it. So stir it up because you don't want to squelch the bottom. You don't want to burn the bottom of the pot, right? You don't want to burn this at all. We just want to get this all nice and cooked through. This is almost really similar, I feel like, to a lot of, like, different African staples. Uh, I feel like this is how, like, fufu was made. 
Um, I've seen like a lot of really, really similar videos on the subject matter. And so guys, it's still really nice and creamy, but it's going to get a little thicker. It's going to get a little starchy. It's going to all get a little stickier. Oh, the more that we agitate and break this stuff down. Guys, it is a bit of a process, so please forgive me for not being super present. I do have the chat with me, so this is a really good time to ask me any and all questions that you may have. While I'm just in the process of stirring up my allergy for today. Oof, give my arm a rest, have a little sip of water. And get back to it. Because we can't wait, we cannot sleep on this. Five more minutes of cook time, six more minutes of cook time. Why am I so entertaining? Uh, great question. I have been on camera for a long time doing a lot of different things. Used to do stand up, I'm a video game commentator. How much time on average do I spend cooking each day? Well, so 26 stacks, I cook three times a week. I cook on these streams. Outside of my streams, I make enough food at home that I don't really need to cook outside of this. Aside from like a novelty perspective, we sometimes just throwing around lunch. So basically, the amount of time I spend each week cooking is the amount of time I'm actually on stream. Whew. Guys, I'm working up a sweat with this one. This is a lot of effort. You have to just keep going. You have to keep mixing, scrape off the spoon, get all of it inside of the pot. <sighs> Good food takes effort. How long will this dish last you? The harcho itself? Oh, it's going to at least last through like an entire week. So it's the two of us, right? It's myself and my mom that live here. And so this is going to be a lot of our meals for the time being. Also, Taza, welcome on in. So guys, five more minutes of stirring that we got to get through. Five to four more minutes of constantly going. It's getting nice and sticky. I love grits so much, but adding the corn in, we have to stir it so much to make sure that it doesn't squirch on the bottom and that the corn flour cooks evenly. Because it's so thick and viscous, it can easily poorly cook on uh, some parts of it. So we have to be constantly, constantly mixing this bad boy. Oh, oh. Lord, it's on the heat, it's still going, it's still cooking. This is a lot of effort. It's almost more laborious than a bechamel because of just how thick this is. Nothing wrong with something being a little thick though. Okay, and so we're cooking this guys until the raw corn flour taste is gone, until the raw taste of the masa harina is, is uh, gone. So let's have a little taste. It still has some of that raw corn taste, right? Still a little bit powdery and so, we go back in and we stir it up some more. Because we don't want to taste raw corn, my friends. We just want a delicious, beautiful porridge. Whew. Yes, I have heard of fufu, absolutely. And in fact, this is really similar to fufu 26 sacks. That's why I brought it up before. I'm breaking up. <laughs> Guys, I'm sweating here. There's like a boiling pot next to me and everything. This is, this is effort. This is a labor of love, my friends. Okay. Ugh. Stirring it up, continuing to let it all cook. Nice medium heat. Giving it a second just so I can give my arm a little rest. I'm gonna have a little sip of water. Okay, and let's keep it going. In fact, I might even just rotate my pot just to make sure I'm getting all the sides of it. There you go. Oh, so much effort, guys, to get properly cooked greens, but it will be worth it. Yep, that taste is slowly leaving. The raw corn taste is leaving, guys. It's getting there, slowly but surely. I promise. Two to three more minutes of cook time, and then we will be golden. And then we will be perfect, and then we can add in the cheese, guys. So stick with me. Stay with me. Is everybody still watching? I want to hear the nice yes, chef. Please and thank you. Oh. And fufu is less of a dish, uh, 26 stacks, as much as it is like a staple to be eaten with other things, right? It is the base of a lot of different things, right? You eat it with stews and soups. So this is all really, really similar. Oh. All of it scraped up, all of it back inside. A nice silicone spatula just bends 
to the will of the pot, make sure that everything is nicely and evenly cooking, scraping everything up, my friends. One to two more minutes of cooking more. My arm as is exhausted, truly, from whipping this up. But we gotta keep going, we have to stay strong. We must stay vigilant. Because I wanna get something really delicious, guys. Ugh. Okay. Oh. Lord, it saved me. This process is not getting done in a second. Mm. That's it. The raw corn flour taste. Yep. Guys, it is practically gone now. We started out with like a whole tablespoon and a half of that corn flour. We added it in. And now that, that taste... Right, like that raw tortilla taste, it's almost entirely gone. And so, we can stop. Maybe another 30, no, no, no. We can, we can definitely stop with this stuff, guys. Let's lower the heat. Oh, no, no, this is, this is worse than making guac with the mocajete because I have a boiling pot next to me while I'm doing this. So, definitely worse. Definitely, definitely worse. Okay, my friends, we dropped the heat back onto a low. And now, you know what time it is. It is time for the cheese. Let's add in all of my lovely sologoni. Oh my God, that's a lot of cheese relative to this amount. Maybe we don't add all of it. Let's stir it up. Let's get all of that cheese inside. Let's get all of it melted and stretchy. All of it melted up. All of it inside. And let's start building the allergy, my friends. And now we're also going to do some salt because again, this doesn't have enough salt. My sulguni isn't particularly salty. So add in a couple of handfuls of that right inside and add it in and mix it in my friends. Mix it and mix it and mix it and mix it until all of that cheese is dissolved. And we have these incredible cheesy grits known as a lodgy. So, ooh, guys, this is becoming even more difficult as we go on. My arm like gave up on that spatula just now, but we have to keep pushing. We have to keep going. We have to get all of that cheese inside and melt it. Super low heat, guys, or even turn your heat off for the step because we don't want to split the cheese. Let's go ahead and get the last of my cheese inside. I wanted to use up all of my suluguni, and so if this is too cheesy, then so be it. Let's get all of it inside, my friends. All of it mixed up. All of it melted in and throughout. It's almost like aligo, right? It's cheesy, it's creamy, it's starchy, it's sticky. It is delicious, guys. Whew. That is just about done, my friends. That is becoming so tough to keep mixing, but we have to pull through. Let's get the last of the cheese all melted in, all of it mixed in the inside. And let's have a little taste of this bad boy and see how it came out. So stretchy. Mm. Well, that's good. I don't want it to be too salty though, because uh, my stew is gonna be really salty. And this is meant to be the base, right? This is meant to be eaten with the soup. And so I'm going to intentionally slightly undershoot it. But guys, that is my finished allergy. That was so much effort. That was so much work for something that should be so simple, but I wanted to make something properly, profoundly delicious. And thus, this is the only way to do it. Cheesy and stretchy. Look at that, right? Beautiful. I think it's beautiful at least. To some, it may look a little unassuming. To others though, gorgeous. Okay. I don't know why I'm keep, I continue to stir it. I don't think I have much of a reason to anymore. So let's go ahead and get all of it back into the pot, my friends. All of it back inside. That is now officially done. Let's go ahead and have another taste. And I'm gonna put a lid on it and let it chill out. Mm, that's good. That is really good. Wow, okay. I'm actually quite impressed with how that came out. That was really, really delicious. Okay, slap a lid on it. Let's set it aside. And we're just gonna let that chill out. 
until it's time for us to eat it. And so, my friends, in the meantime, we're just going to be going in with the rest of the stew. That was laborious. That was a lot of effort that we just put in for that one little humble pot of porridge. Here is my stew, my friends. And we're just cooking it down. We're boiling it down. We're getting the celery softened. We're getting everything going for today. Move that aside. I'll get rid of this. Because we no longer need this anymore. Oof. So, everybody, quick little recap session. We are almost done for today. We finished the Elargy, the Georgian corn and Sulguni cheese porridge, basically cheesy grits. We have the stew currently on the stove, bubbling away, boiling away, reducing down, becoming full of flavor, and it is time for us to also finish it. And so finishing it is not just boiling it, of course, because we're going to also have to add in um, some ajika, and we're going to add in a pile of fresh herbs, which we're about to do right now. I'm just going to take a second and clean up my station, just get rid of some stuff behind me while I have a chance, just throw some things into the dishwasher, just so that it is out of my way, out of sight, and out of mind. That's that, that's all of my stuff for the stew, guys. The stew is boiling away. Everything is looking super, super delicious now. We're just looking to evaporate some of the excess moisture, okay? So just keep it bubbling, keep it boiling, keep it moving. Until you get your desired consistency, that is. Okay. Let's also do a nice big hit of salt. Now we're going to need plenty of salt in this thing. Plenty of salt. Season up nice and good. Okay guys, let's go ahead and now move on to the fresh herbs. We're going to have a mixture of parsley, of dill, and some coriander. And so, let's go ahead and get that out now. Let's get that going. And let's get that processed, my friends. The trifecta. And the most important of which, everybody, is the coriander, is the cilantro. The cilantro is one of the most defining herbs of all of Georgian cuisine, my friends, okay? So I just want to have a little taste of my cooking liquid. Mm. Already really delicious, but at the moment, it's super, super plain. It doesn't have everything that, in it that we need. We're going to add in the ajika. It's going to be delicious. Okay. But first, let's give this bad boy a little stir. Oh, beautiful. Big pot of this stuff. Okie dokie. Get that transferred away. And let's also actually do the rest of the garlic while we also just have a second of time. I want to get the rest of my garlic in like this when it's basically raw and food to just boil in a little teeny tiny bit. So let's do all of that garlic in now. Lovely. Okay guys, let's go ahead and finish off the herbs. Let's do those bad boys now. Oof. Also, wait, I did forget something. I wanted to add in some fenugreek into this as well. While we have a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and grab some fenugreek. Also plenty of fenugreek in Georgian cuisine. Is that my fenugreek? It sure is. And this bad boy, I'm gonna do about like a teaspoon or two inside. Is everybody still watching? I wanna hear the nice yes chef right now, please and thank you. Open up my fenugreek. And we're gonna do this, like, again, roughly a teaspoon inside. There you go. Lovely. My ajika has some fenugreek, but I really wanted to up it up. I wanted to up it, I wanted it to be full of fenugreek. I wanted it to be full of flavor. Okay, dokie. So guys, finally, without further ado, let's do the rest of the herbs, okay? So, the most important herb in Georgian cuisine, guys, is gonna be the cilantro. The other ones, I'm going to actually cook in there so they really, really soften and we don't feel them. But the cilantro, I'm going to basically add in towards the end. And I mean an aggressive, aggressive amount of cilantro, guys. I mean, a, like, half a bundle of cilantro is going to be going into this today. As always, I keep my fresh herbs in the fridge in a little Tupperware with a paper towel to naturally control the humidity, to naturally control the moisture of it all. Ooh, that's hot. Okay, and so let's just go ahead and get that bad boy all prepped. 
Guys, I'm going to go ahead and just pick off any of the big stems because again, I hate the texture of the big stems. Um, I find them to be a little tough. I find them to be a little chewy, a little fibrous. And so even if we're losing it on some flavor, I am okay with that. So all of this cilantro, and again, it's fine if we have some thin, thin stems. Let's just get all of the big stems plucked off. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me in the meantime? I'm just gonna go ahead and move my pot over. Just like that, awesome. Whew. And we're going guys, we're continuing to go. We still have just the finishing herbs, we have the finishing ajika to add on in, and then everything is gonna be perfect and ready for our consumption. How long would it take me to make this if there was no stream? So, Tarina, if there was no stream, I would probably just do this in a pot and not a pressure cooker. So probably a little longer, but it would overall be faster since there'll be more time when I'm sitting down. Uh, the reason why it seems so long is because, like, how fast I was trying to get everything done uh, while the stuff was in the pressure cooker itself. And so what I would probably do is I would put in a regular pot, I would let that go, I would do all of the prep, and then I would do the allergy, and then I would have like an hour of downtime or so. So roughly, I couldn't tell you how much time, but the beauty of something like this is you make a lot, guys. You make a lot, and it's able to last you a long time. So again, we're going through all the cilantro, my friends, and we're plucking off each of the leaves from the stem, just continuing to pluck and pluck and pluck. Lovely. Just plucking all of it off. What is the most adventurous dish I've ever tried? So define adventurous. I am not sure because I've eaten 26 stacks, I've eaten everything. I've eaten everything and I basically will eat everything. I don't know a single thing off the top of my head that I wouldn't eat and try. Not common or polarizing. Polarizing, I mean, I'm a huge, I don't know, I do love foie gras. Right, so that's pretty polarizing, right? Uh, otherwise, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's like a polarizing food. Cause I, I do truthfully like everything when it's done well. Like balut, I love balut. The only thing that's polarizing about it is uh, the actual visual of it. I've not had muktuk, um, Serena, so that's like the seal, right? That's like the raw seal because don't really have access to that. Head cheese? Head cheese isn't even that polarizing, that owl. Head cheese is just a cold cut. It's delicious. Love head cheese. A lot of cilantro, my friends. That is an aggressive, aggressive pile of cilantro. And that is what Georgian cooking is all about. Georgian cooking uses aggressive amounts of cilantro. Okay? So we're almost done plucking all of it. Ugh. I told you guys, today is gonna be a long one. We're in it for the long haul. Have I ever had chicken feet? Of course I have 26 stacks. I don't actually typically enjoy chicken feet because there's not a lot to get there. You're mostly eating the sauce and then you get some of like the sticky like skin, but there's almost nothing on a chicken foot. And I'd rather just use chicken feet for stocks, which is what I do. Guys, as always, it is time for us to get the cilantro sliced. The number one mistake, as always guys, I never want to see you chop your cilantro. We do not chop cilantro in this household. Is that clear? We do not chop, we only slice. We do not chop, we exclusively slice. When we chop, we crush it. When we slice it, we're nice and delicate and gentle. So I'm just gonna go in here, I'm giving my stew just another stir around, just making sure that she's doing good. That is the viscosity that I'm looking for, that looks good now. Lovely. Okay. My friends, we take all of the herbs. I wanna hear yes chef right now, please and thank you. We take it and we bundle it up in our hands. We're going to hold it like a baby bird, not so firmly that it flies away, but not so, uh, you know, jet, not so firmly that we crush its head out, not so gently that it flies away. We take it and we bundle it up and we set it down on the cutting board, guys, and we're just going to give it a nice slice using the fullest length of a knife, and we're only gonna give it one pass, just one pass through. And all of this cilantro, my friends, all of it is going to be added into the hancho. So all of it, let's take it back, let's roll it up, bundle it up, and we're slicing and slicing and slicing and slicing and slicing. But we're not crushing it, we're not chopping it, we're not destroying it, guys. The more that you crush and you chop it, the more flavor that you end up losing. So we slice 
all of it up nice and good got all of it processed okay and let's go ahead and get rid of that stem that's all of my cilantro that i'm gonna need for today chat let's go ahead and just scoop it all up and just put it into my bowl and i told you that was an aggressive amount of cilantro wasn't it okay next up let's go ahead and deal with some parsley i don't think this is parsley yep that's just my cilantro i ended up putting my parsley away accidentally let's do some parsley and guys we're not going to use nearly as much parsley as the cilantro we're only going to use roughly this much okay because again georgian cooking is all about the cilantro and the other herbs are sometimes just a feature also before we do begin with the herbs guys let's go ahead and quickly add in some of my lovely ajika so this is something that i prepared on sunday my friends this right here is ajika and this is what's going to add the spice this was chilies this was herbs this was cilantro this was spices okay and we have it ready to go and let's go ahead and add a nice big generous spoon of it directly inside and let it just dissolve and bubble away and then we'll taste it for the seasoning okay this is what the real seasoning of the soup is guys all of that ajika so i'm going in there i'm scraping up the bottom making sure that nothing is stuck to the bottom of the pot oh did i just splash that on me Okay, luckily that was not on me. I only uh, splashed it on the entirety of my stove. So gonna be a little bit more for me to clean after, but that's okay. So I'm, guys, I'm just stirring it up. I'm scraping up the bottom. Anything that could be potentially stuck to said bottom. There you go. Add that in, bring it back up to a boil and let it go and let it do its thing. That is a good looking beef stew, my friends. And now let's also give the broth another proper taste. We're tasting for salinity, we're tasting for heat, okay? Woo! That's so good. Oh my friends, that is so delicious. That is pretty remarkable at the moment. And it's still not done cooking yet. We still gotta add in the rest of the herbs. But that at the moment already, guys, it has so much flavor, it has so much depth. Beautiful. Okay, we have all of this parsley. Guys, same exact idea. We're going in here and we're getting good at the stems yet again. Because again, the stems are a little too fibrous for me. Okay. Just keep going through it all. Just get rid of the big chunks of stems. Oof, we're in the final stages, my friends. We added in the ajika. We're just continuing to boil it down. We're going to go ahead and reduce it. And then we're going to plate it. Is everybody excited? This is where we would say, yeah, chef, of course. All of the parsley, all of it nicely and beautifully processed. Okay, okay. Getting all of it done. All right, and I think that should be good. All right, my friends, let's go ahead and once again, same exact idea. We take it and we bundle it up in our hands like a little teeny tiny baby bird. We set it down and we slice it and we slice it and we slice it and we slice it. The parsley, I'm going a little thinner because it's a little coarser uh, than the cilantro is. It's a little bit more papery. And so, I don't want to get any of that paperiness out of it. So a little thinner, a little thinner. Just slice, 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 slice it up. All the way through, my friends. Nice and thin, nice and thin. Gently, gently, gently. There you go. And let's just take this bundle back. Just make sure that all the leaves got that treatment. Okay. And let's get all of these herbs inside of my bowl. And finally, guys, we got to do the dill. Let's go ahead and get that done as well. Where is my lovely fresh dill? Same exact idea, my friends. And in fact, the dill, we only need so little. We only need a little teeny tiny bit of it. Super tiny little bundle of that bad boy. And let's go ahead and once again, you already know the drill. You already know what's happening. We're taking the fronds off. Get rid of the thick stems. We don't want them. Not here at least. Nice and easy to pluck. 
compared to the other ones. Just pluck it and pluck it and pluck it and keep on going. Okay. And last two to go. There you go. Okay, and that looks good. And so everybody, once again, we bundle it and we slice it. And I want my dill and my parsley specifically to cook in more than the cilantro. The cilantro we're going to add just as we shut off the heat, okay? So, once again, thin, thin slices, my friends. Slice it and slice it and slice it all the way through. Just like that. Give it a rotation. Get rid of any of the chunks that did not get that same slicing treatment. Lovely. And let's scoop it up and put it into the bowl. My friends, let's go ahead and uh, add all of these fresh herbs back into the pot. Add all of them inside. And then we're going to add in another big, big hit of salt. Because we got a big pot of stew, guys. It needs a lot of seasoning. Okay? Big stew like this, big seasoning. So a bunch of salt goes directly inside. Let's go ahead and stir in all of my herbs, all of my salt, all of my seasonings, everything. Let's get that all incorporated, my friends. Look at the stew. Look at the stew, my friends. Look how beautiful it looks. All right, Kudzigo, thank you so much for being cute. Look at the stew. Look how gorgeous it is. Let's just get a still shot of this, huh? What is my still? Right, we're stewing in the dough. We're stewing in the parsley, the ajika. Unsticking anything that could be stuck to the bottom of the pot here. And then we're going to have ourselves a nice little taste. Full of greens, full of herbs. Nice and spicy for my ajika, for my pepper paste. Let's have a taste. Mm. Mm. So good. So good, everybody. That is incredible. Uh, we're not adding anything to thicken it. This is not meant to be a particularly thick stew. So here's what it needs. It needs, you guessed it, more salt. I'm adding in whatever else I had left in here. And then it also needs a splash of acidity. And so my friends, this is where a little splash of vinegar comes into play. Well, rather a generous splash. Splash of vinegar, splash of salt, and that's just going to round everything out. Balance it, bring balance to the heart chop, bring balance to the stew. Okay, and again, I'm just like scooping it up. I'm almost deglazing the sides, getting it all back into the pot. That's what I'm talking about. That is a good looking stew. Let's have another taste. One more time. Mm. That's it. That is so good. Everybody, let's do... I want, I want some more ajika in here. I want some more of my spicy, herbaceous, garlicky paste right inside. I want another big spoonful of it. I'm doing a spicy, uh, spicy, spicy version of it today. Yeah, Serena, that was salt by the glug. That is how much salinity this stew needed, okay? Let's get all of it incorporated. Oof, it needed a lot. We added in the ajika, guys, and this is gonna be the real flavor of today's stew. And we wanna intentionally keep it almost raw, Right, so we get all of its, you know, intensity, all of its pungency. Almost done, everybody. We're at the, we're at the finish line. And once that gets there, once we got that taste that we wanted, we will plate her up. Okay. That's all going. It's all cooking down now. Let's have another taste. How do we do? Ooh, that's good. That now has that spice. That has that kick, my friends. Okay. I think it is time for us to call it. Let's go ahead, shut off the heat. We're going to add in almost all the cilantro. I'll save in a little bit for garnish. And this is what's going to take it over the top. And so the rest of the cilantro is just going to be for garnish. Let's take that and let's stir it into the pot, my friends. And this is my finished harucho. This had so much love, so much attention, and so much care be put into it. Stewed tender beef, onions, tomatoes, homemade ajika, a Georgian condiment paste, 
with chilies and dill and parsley and celery. We added more celery, we added fenugreek, we added savory, we added coriander seeds. It's spicy, it's salty. We added in some vinegar, some freshly charred and pureed tomatoes. Look at that stew, look at that glisten. Lovely. And of course, plenty of cilantro. And now my friends, it is time for us to begin the great plating. So let's go ahead, let's get rid of all of this stuff. And the soup is probably best if you let it also sit for a little bit so it's not, you know, scalding hot when you try to eat it. But we have no such time today because we gotta get this all done with. I'm gonna get rid of my knife, guys. And I'm just gonna go throw these into my dishwasher really quickly. Beautiful. And I'm just going to wipe down my station really quickly. And it is silky and glossy, yeah, but it doesn't have a lot of fat. That was a fairly lean beef that we used, right? It's not like a chuck or anything. It was fairly lean. Um, it doesn't have too much oil on it or anything, which I've honestly come to really hate about a lot of stews. I really don't like it when it has like too much oil because then you can't really taste any of the broth or anything in it, okay? And that's all of the stuff. And I'm just gonna go throw that into the trash. And now my friends, let's go ahead and plate this up. Are we all ready for this? First and foremost, guys, let's go ahead and get some elargy. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and grab, I guess my spatula would still be a fine tool for something like this. Ooh, as it cooled down, it got like even like thicker, but that's okay. Just break it up a little bit. Because as it cools down, it just gets a little bit gummy. And that's totally normal. You just got to go in there. You got to break it up a tiny bit. And so, guys, my nice, delicious, cheesy elargy. Look at this thing. Oof. It's so thick. Please snap. There you go. And get all of this. Ah! Don't sl Thank you. Get back in here. Not my best plating ever. It is incredibly sticky. Mmm. That was a lot of cheese. I think mine has a lot more than a traditional allergy in it because I just want to use up the rest of my sulguni. And so, let's get that all into my bowl. There you go. That's that. Mm. And now guys, the star of today's show, the real hero of everything, is my heart chop. So let me go ahead and grab a ladle. Let me grab my bowl. Okay. And let's give myself a nice, big, generous bowl. We're stirring in all of that fresh cilantro. Beautiful. That's it right there, my friends. That is it. Look at my hocho. And then of course, we saved for last a little teeny tiny bit of some fresh cilantro. Just right on top. Perfect. Everybody, we have done it. We have done everything that we needed to do for today. That is my hocho and my elargy. So everybody, let's do one last recap session. Is everybody watching? Is everybody listening? I wanna hear a nice, yes, chef, please. And thank you, because it's time for us to talk about everything that we made and everything that we managed to get done today. Everybody, here is what we did. We have some hocho. This is a traditional Georgian stew. It's beautiful, it's glossy, and it is above all else, delicious. We've, we seared off a bunch of beef. We fried some onions, some tomato paste, and some garlic. We threw this into a pressure cooker with bay leaves. Then we added in celery. We added in some freshly charred tomatoes. We added in a homemade ajika, which is a pepper paste made with herbs and chilies. We added in fresh cilantro, parsley, and dill. We added in fenugreek. We added in coriander. And we also added in savory. It is delicious, it is rich, and it is vegetal. And then my friends, alongside it, we have served some elargy. And elargy 
is essentially cheese grits. We have a bunch of suluguni, which is Georgian uh, cheese, very similar to that of a mozzarella. It's stretchy and it's sticky and it's delicious. And so this alongside such a stew, it's just corn grits, white corn grits and a bunch of cheese. Everybody, I'm gonna have some of the grits. Mm. So simple. This by itself, incredibly simple and delicious. And we added some masa harina in there as well for some added stickiness. And guys, you know what I bet is gonna be amazing? The stew. Actually, I don't really know how to put that down on that kind of a plate. Have some of the stew. Look at it, green and vegetal, full of herbs, full of spices. It's boiling hot at the moment, but that's okay. Let's have a little sip of just the broth itself. Mm. So good. It is spicy and it's full of flavor. Let's have some of the beef. Um, I don't know if they're supposed to be eaten together. I'm gonna definitely have some of it together. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's so good. And now my friends, let's take some of the allergy and let's drown it in all that delicious stew. Mm. And together it's pretty special. Mm. Mm. That's what it's at. That is where it's at, my friends. Take all of that together. Mm. Mm. The allergy just soaks all of it right up, all together. Mm. That's so good. That is perfect. And that's it. Whew. That was a lot of effort. That was a lot of active time. We were busy. We made everything from scratch today. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. The next cooking show is going to be this Friday, 5 p.m. EDT. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for... Let me fix my hair really quickly. I don't know what that was just now. Ugh. That was just a lot of work today. Friday, 5 p.m. EDT. If you would like, please support the Patreon. If you'd like the show, if you'd like to support what we do here, you can type in exclamation mark Patreon. Um... Yeah, if you'd like to help support the show, I'm going to see you all this Friday. Everybody, hope you all enjoy. This is something I highly recommend making for yourselves, especially the hancho. It is lovely, it is delicious, it's herbaceous, and it's spicy. Ah, oh, incredible. Thank you all. I hope you all have a good night. Be safe, be well, and I will see you all in just a couple days' time. Bye-bye.